From Amazon Music, I Hear Fear is a new anthology series of suspenseful stories hosted by Carrie Mulligan. These stories are inspired by true events and real places, so the next sound you hear could be your own scream. In each episode of I Hear Fear, you'll be treated to a new psychological thriller, a forest monster who lures teens into the woods and never lets them return, a line of beauty products that takes the search for youth to dark extremes, and an EDM party that turns deadly when the DJ takes over more than just the dance floor. These might sound like urban legends, but I Hear Fear proves that the scariest stories of all are the ones that are true. I Hear Fear will introduce immersive horror and lead you straight into the heart of darkness. Prepare to be taken on a journey into the unknown. Mulligan's engaging narration makes her a good fit for the Twilight Zone-esque Rod Serling role, and the tales themselves, about death-filled parties and classic haunted house parties, are a perfect fit for the spooky season. So if you're interested in things that go bump in the night, I heartily recommend this podcast. And hey Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, I Hear Fear, in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. This is actually my stepmom's best friend's story. I do have my own, but I'm very hesitant to drag some of them up. I'm hoping that telling somebody else's will open me up to a little more. Anyway, my stepmom didn't like us much, but she told my sister three years older and I this experience growing up to scare us out of being stupid, I guess. It was my family's stranger danger story, I guess you could say. My stepmom, her name's Macy, grew up as a, a kind of a privileged teen in the 70s, and her mum had moved their family over here, the States, from England when she was about nine. She went to a pretty nice high school in a really nice town. There, she made friends with a girl, Lily, who didn't exactly run with Macy's type of crowd. Popular, stereotypical, etc. But they really hit it off, and Lily would take Macy out to do her type of stuff like hiking, fishing, sailing. There's even a hilarious set of pictures of them camping. But my stepmom has raccoon eyes and looks like she hates everything. Anyway, because of Lily's influence, the two of them would do stuff like that a good amount. And one Sunday, they decided to go hike in some hills about maybe an hour away. Macy put on what I'm sure were her extremely expensive hiking shoes and the two of them drove off to the hiking trails. Lily parked in this big clearing with makeshift parking spots. You know the thing, like a, a piece of wood marking the head of a space. But there were no other cars there and this was only important in hindsight, I guess. So they started hiking up the hill, off the path because Lily fancied herself as something of a rebel. But the hike was nothing extraordinary. If you asked my stepmom, she would just lament for 15 minutes how sticky and buggy it was. They reached the top of the hill and my stepmom was done. The polished and pampered side of her was coming out and she groaned until Lily begrudgingly said okay. They would rest and then walk down again, slower. They'd been heading down the hill for maybe 10 minutes when Macy started whinging again. Lily conceded to walking down the side of the road instead of the rough hiking trail. So there they are, probably looking like a couple of tools geared up for hiking and walking down a terrible road and after not even five minutes, a truck pulled up next to them. It was red and rusty and just generally looked like a, an old clunker. The guy driving rolled down the window and the girls looked in through the passenger side window. He had a big beard, a baseball cap pulled down and long brown hair. He greeted them and even smiled through his beard, asking if they needed a ride. Macy described him as charming and even cute. Lily still says the moment that he greeted them, her heckles went up. Despite her better judgment though, my stepmom convinced her to get into the truck. It must only be a 10 minute drive down to the car top, she said. The two girls opened the passenger's door to this rusty old thing and the guy directed them behind the seat to get into the back. They settled in and the truck started rumbling forwards. Lily always says that this was the point that it hit her what a huge mistake they had just made. The back seat was clean enough but there was a rope on the floor behind the driver's seat and four boxes of sarin wrap half hanging out from under the passenger seat. It seemed creepy and weird but 
Lily didn't want to freak my stepmom out, so she just kept her mouth shut. After ten minutes, the woods didn't look any clearer, and they hadn't seen another car the whole time. Lily asked how long he thought that it would be, and he said that he was taking a different route down the hill and had to stop somewhere to get something first. That was it, too. The girls were 16, 17, and Lily didn't want to press the issue. She was scared. She can remember his hair because she was sitting behind him. He looked like a, a woodsy guy, but his hair was super tangled and dirty. She noticed crusted mud on his collar and tried to find something identifiable about him, but just got scared the more that she picked up on all the little details. He was youngish, though, strong-looking, and had about a foot on both of them. They didn't ask any more questions, and he didn't offer any more information, and they drove on. Several minutes after that, they reached a, a tiny shack or a log cabin looking place, right there in the clearing of the trees too. There was an old stump there, someone had been chopping wood, and a huge axe stuck into the log. Lily was definitely on red alert now. The guy turned off the truck and slipped out of it, saying, I'll be right back, don't get out and he disappeared into the house. Lily, she tried to talk to my stepmom about how she was incredibly uncomfortable, but she mostly just dismissed it. Lily started begging, increasingly freaked out, and finally put her foot down, demanding Macy exit the truck with her right now. So, they got out and walked around the front of the vehicle. The house was about 50 yards in front of them, why this guy would have left two young girls in the truck alone while going into the house is beyond me, and they wandered around, looking at it hesitantly. If this guy really was decent and just trying to give them a ride, it would be super rude to just run off, right? My stepmom had this strict upbringing when it comes to manners and public persona, and she saw it as an issue of that nature, so she actually started to head back to the truck, opening the front door to climb in behind the driver's seat and Lily was ticked off and followed her to yell some more. On the driver's side floor, half hidden under the seat though, there was a, a big hatchet there, and it had dried red-brown stains covering the blade and stuck to the floor under it. Lily understandably lost it at seeing this. My stepmom started getting hysterical too, and so they decided that leaving was by far their best option at this point and just booked it off the side of the property into the trees. They bumbled around in the trees for a little while, until Lily was fairly confident that they were on their way back down the hill. My stepmom cried all the way down. Lily did feel bad about it, but was also completely freaked out that he would hear it, and kept trying to calm her down. When they finally got back down to the bottom, and saw the old wooden fence that surrounded the original parking area, they were relieved. But as they got closer, they saw it. There was the truck. It was parked on the other side of the gravelly makeshift lot. And it was just sitting there, facing the other way, innocently. But they couldn't see if anyone was in it, and of course, Macy wanted to run for the car, but Lily was super hesitant. She managed to calm my stepmom down, saying that she wanted to wait a bit before running out into the open to see what was out there. Remember, this is in the 70s too, so there's no cell phones. In fact, there was no ranger station or anyone around. The parking lot was big and empty and open, and who knows what would have happened if they decided to stroll across it. Thankfully, Lily convinced my stepmom to chill, and the two of them sort of hunkered down against a big tree for a bit, hidden by bushes and other trees, and waited it out for what seemed to be a couple of hours. Then, dark started to fall. All the animals started coming out at this point and making noises, and my stepmom, predictably, started getting antsy about this and bothering Lily, who was tired and moments away from giving in. She was just planning their dash to the car when they heard a clunk. Across the twilight lit lot, they watched as one of the back doors of their car swung open, and the bearded guy slid his way out of the back seat. He got out, shut the door, looked around at the surrounding woods for several moments, and then walked back to his truck. The truck lumbered past their car and out of sight. Several minutes after watching him drive away, they sprinted to their car as fast as they could, jumped in, and they peeled out before they had even shut the doors. 
If this guy is still alive, then he's really old, but still, be careful out there, guys, and don't make the same mistake that they did. So this happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door, and this really confused me, as no one ever used that door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time, and all of the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little bit inconvenient to access, as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs, as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. So, it just didn't make any sense to use the back entrance, and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. Anyway... As I approached the back door, I saw two tall men in the window standing at the door, and a chill instantly went down my spine. I didn't feel safe opening the door, so I called out hello. One of the men, they tapped on the window. Uh, yeah, hello, may we come in? We're with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for cable, but didn't have any issues with it. I replied, uh, we're not having any issues, is there a problem? Ma'am, the man said, can we come in? We're servicing the area and it's important that we look at your cable. I shook my head, but we're not having any issues, I repeated, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we're visiting every resident. Let us in so that we can do our job. I noticed the man grab the doorknob and try to open the locked door at this point. I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues. I repeated, trying not to convey shakiness of my voice. So you don't need to be in here. The two figures appeared to shuffle and then sort of straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and we need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work, and I gripped the knife tighter. Ma'am? Ma'am? I saw him try the doorknob again. I closed my eyes and felt overwhelming gratitude of always locking my doors. And just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry, I, I can't help you, but could I please get your names and badge numbers? I can give you a supervisor a call to let them know that our cable is fine. I heard another shuffle and one of the men replied, uh, No need to, ma'am. We're sorry that we wasted your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't even hold my phone. With the knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of the other hand, I sank to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and started crying again after he came home, and he immediately called the Bresnan Cable Company and spoke to a representative, who informed us that no one from their company was out on an assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company, but nobody had. My family and I went on a trip to the Hocking Hills area of southern Ohio a few weeks ago. There was a place that I always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town Moonville Rail Tunnel. I've never been to this area, so I didn't know what to expect, but I did know that it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin using Google for GPS to the location. We start driving, and it's, for lack of a better word, real impoverished where we're driving. Sort of hills have eyes-esque. We literally only see a few cars on the way there and are on the back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter into a forest, and we're close to the tunnel, there was a sign that said that we were entering Bubblewood. For a little bit of additional information too, I drive a Mercedes that I'm just lucky to have and I have my husband in the car, a black man with dreadlocks, my 10-year-old son, who is non-verbal autistic, and my 6-year-old daughter as well. We drive down this really creepy stone road into the forest and there's really nothing back there. No houses, no cars, nobody... We see signs that we're close and we pull into the parking lot. There's a footbridge with some stuff on it that people put there. We walk over the footbridge and make our way toward the tunnel 
which is a lot larger than I expected. We hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot, and soon a truck comes driving through the tunnel toward us while we're on foot. Whoever's in the truck, he gets out of it with a chainsaw and it's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere that we go and even through the tunnel. I tried to make small talk with him and pull some info about if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources or something, but he really wasn't budging. We turn around to walk out of the tunnel and he starts using a chainsaw behind us and the sound is just echoing through this tunnel. At this point, we have no cell phone service and literally nobody knows my family is out there except us. I was already worried my car was sending the wrong idea to people like we have money or something, which we don't. But we rush to the car and get the kids in their booster seats and this guy comes driving over the footbridge in his truck towards us in the parking lot. I honestly don't even know how this truck fit on it. He stops again and gets out of his truck and starts walking the other direction, much to our relief. But it was about this time that I then noticed that there are dusty handprints on my car. I asked my husband if they were a match. I don't know who could have touched the car, honestly, because we were with the chainsaw man the entire time that we were there. But at that, we get out of there as fast as we can. Just a few minutes later, I look into my rearview mirror, though, and there's a bunch of dust kicked up behind us, and there he is. He had to have driven pretty quickly on the stone road to catch up to us like that. I mean, there's nowhere to go in these woods. The road is basically one lane, and we have no cell service or GPS or anything now. Every time that I think we lose him as well, he's there again. I'm waiting for my tires to get popped or something, or for this guy to ram me off the road into a ravine in the woods, but finally we get out of the woods and I turn out and he's still following we were following printed directions to get back and I ended up making a, a wrong turn in the excitement, I guess you could say. But the guy in the truck was finally gone at this point and I turned around to go back past the stone road that goes into the forest. The guy in the truck was finally gone at this point and I turned around to go back past the stone road that goes into the forest. But there's only one lone house near this road and there is his truck parked there. And I mean, he had to have seen us drive onto this road into the woods and taken some back way to the tunnel or something. To this day, I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event, and it was terrifying, to say the least. So every year, my friends and I go on a week-long canoe trip in Algonquin Park, usually just to drink and fish. The past summer, we had decided to stay on Tom Thompson Lake, if you know it, for our main site, which ended up being on an island in the middle of the lake. There were six of us in total, with one group of four in a large tent, one guy in a solo tent, and myself in a hammock between them. Now one night, we had been huddled around the fire at about one in the morning when we noticed a flare in the sky over what we assumed was an adjacent lake. We didn't think much of it until an awful scream came across the lake about 20 minutes later. I was the only one left sober at this time and there wasn't much that we could do, so we assumed that it was a problem bear in the area that we'd been warned about from the outfitters. But the strange part came after everyone had gone to bed. At 4am, the other five guys went into their tents and passed out while I lay in my hammock listening to them fall asleep. For reference, the group of four were about maybe 30 feet to my right, and the other guy about 100 feet to my left on the far shore. As I watched the stars and tried to will myself to sleep, I noticed everything had gone incredibly silent. Suddenly feeling creeped out, I slowed my breathing and stayed as still as I could, thinking about the possible bear and how I was a, a neatly wrapped up meat sack hanging there. But then, I heard a voice call out about 20 feet to my left, by the remains of our fire. It was the voice of my friend Seamus, who was one of the guys passed out in the large tent, or so I thought. Four hellos, with each one sounding sort of more, I don't know, like 
emotionless, I guess you could say. The four hellos all said within maybe six seconds, and although I immediately recognized his voice, every instinct that I had was on high alert, telling me not to respond. I stayed as quiet as I could for the next five minutes, listening for any movement, until I felt the tension leave the air, and it disturbed me a lot to know how normally you can hear every movement in the sight, and yet that night, at that moment, I heard absolutely nothing. Not one thing. Not even crickets or anything. The wind even seemed to die down. Anyway, the next morning, everyone told me that they'd heard nothing, but we agreed to move sites early since we'd all gotten an eerie vibe from that night. This was our sixth trip there too, and we've never had any creepy experiences before, so this one was out of the blue. I hope that what I heard that night was just some camper with a very similar voice to my friend who would come to see if the site was free or something, or Seamus had somehow stealthily slept walk out of his tent, but I don't know, neither one of them really seems plausible. I mean, I 100% would have heard someone moving for sure. I can only hope nothing happens on future trips for other people, I guess, or for us if we go back there, but it will be hard to forget the fear of this event. So I, a 16-year-old female, found out recently that my grandmom was in the graduating class at Revere High School of 1978. At that time, she was 18 and this story came out because she said something when I told her about the new series on Netflix. Now, you guys should know who I'm talking about. I told her about it and she goes, oh yeah, I remember him and I obviously told her that a lot of people know him because, you know, of all the things that he's done and all that. And she stops me and goes, no, no, I actually graduated with him. I stood there completely frozen. Now, she showed me the yearbook picture, but I don't know if I'm comfortable sharing that on the internet because I don't want people to find out information about my family and all that. But I couldn't lie about this, especially this. I mean, it would be terrible to do that. So, I'll tell you some things that she told me though. This was about two weeks ago, so I'll try and remember what she said word for word. This is how it went. Now, I did go to high school with him, but there were so many kids in that school. I barely even talked to him. Everything you hear about him from high school is basically the 100% truth. He was the definition of weird. He would actually come to school drunk on some days. The only reason that some people started to notice who he was was because he would spaz out as some sort of a joke and he would act like a kid with special needs almost. I don't remember if I had any memorable conversations with him, but I do remember one specific time I saw him in the hallway. I'd only heard about what he's done, but I didn't know if it was actually true, so I asked him, Aren't you the boy who puts on those acts in the hallways? Yes, I am, he said. Why? Do you find me funny? Well, sure, everyone does. I've never really seen you, though. I've only heard the stories people tell. Just wanted to know if it was you. Well, you're right, it is me. Glad you find my jokes enjoyable. And he smiled at me. Not a, a toothy smile, but a grin, I guess. I don't remember talking to him again after that. That was towards the end of the school year. Then the school year ended, and to my luck, he actually appeared in my college. He got kicked out shortly after for, I think, a drinking problem. I never knew of his family life, frankly. I didn't want to know, but... I could tell that it wasn't good and perhaps that's why he was drinking. I never saw him again after that. Well, actually I did, but it was on TV. When I found out what he did though, I can't even begin to describe how I felt about it being the fact that I kind of sort of, well, knew him a bit and went to school with him. I'm not saying that he was normal. I mean, with anybody that turns out like this, people normally say, I could never see them doing this, but... It disgusted me in ways that I can't describe. The first thing the news said was that they caught somebody who they described as a murderer. And later on, they let out the details of what he actually did, and that's what really shook people. Seeing the new series really helps people understand how disgusting that man is. And well, it shows you what he went through, I guess, as well. 
It doesn't make you feel bad for him, which nobody should. I'm glad that he went out the way that he did. Maybe if I didn't ask him the question that day, I, I wouldn't have felt so uneasy about the whole thing. But yeah, I did and that's what happened. So yeah, that's basically it in a nutshell from my grandma and that's what she told me. I can tell that my mother feels uneasy when she talks about it too, but I'm guessing my grandmother has told her already and anyway, it's weird how small this world is and how you just know people who know people and I guess you just never know that somebody could be a serial killer. I want to start by saying that this isn't the first bad experience that I've had dog sitting, but it's definitely the worst. So, I started dog sitting back when I was 13 and I made some good money doing it. I'm currently 19 and this happened when I was 18. I set up an easy way for people to contact me about dog sitting. I put out posts on Facebook and Instagram about it often and would sort of get people in my messages asking to dog sit and whatnot. And I got a notification from Instagram one day stating someone was trying to message me. I accepted it and the message said that me and my wife are looking to find a dog sitter while we go away for a week in Florida. You'll have to do the work from the 4th to the 11th this month. We'll pay you $300 for the week. You're welcome to stay at our house or go back to your own home. I started talking back and forth with this man and his name was Mr. Brown. So I agreed to take the gig and told him that I would stay at his house for the week. Once I got to his house, I was introduced to his two dogs, Mina and Letty. Mina was a little Yorkie and Letty was a blue hound. I was shown around his house, which was surrounded by 76 acres. I live in a farm town and I live on 32 acres myself, so staying here didn't really freak me out or anything. The closest neighbors were pretty far away and you would actually have to drive there if you wanted to talk to them, to be honest. They told me the rules and when to feed them and blah 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 and then Mrs. Brown told me about the nearest neighbor and in her words she was a, a nice person just a little drugged up and confused apparently. She mentioned how sometimes she would pull into their driveway instead of hers and would end up mistaking Mrs. Brown for her dead daughter. Hearing this made me feel pretty bad for her to be honest and I know all too well how hard it is for parents to lose their child because of how my parents were after losing my brother in a car accident. Mrs. Brown said that she shouldn't do anything bad though and if she came up to the house just point her back home and she would leave with no problems. After they left I was down to watch movies and just chill with the dogs and the first two days were fine with no hiccups. The third day however Miss Rose did pull into the driveway I came outside as she was getting out of the car and she looked up to see me and immediately she got back into her car and left. I thought that that was weird but I chalked it up to her realizing that it was the wrong house when she saw me and went back inside. Later that night though I got a call from Mrs. Brown asking if I was okay and I said yeah and I asked why and she then went on to tell me about how she got a call from Miss Rose and that she said that there was a robber at her house. I explained what happened and she just laughed and said that she must have been confused and forgot that they were out of town. I ended the phone call making a note to go over there tomorrow to clear the air about me being a robber and all that. Once I went to bed that night though, things got crazy. I woke up at around 2 hearing a sort of light scratching sound that almost sounded like, I don't know, ticking coming from outside the window. At first I thought that it might have been a bird or some sort of, uh, I don't know, a creature and I left it alone. But the noise kept me from falling asleep and I wanted to scare it away so I got up and went to open the blinds but screamed when I lifted the blinds at the sight of Miss Rose trying to pry the window open with a pair of pliers. But once she saw me though, she started banging on the window with the pliers. The dog started barking now and... I quickly got up, told the dogs to follow me, grabbed my phone and ran to a room with no windows, which was the bathroom, locking the door in case she got in. I called 911 and explained the situation quickly, giving them the address from what I could remember. She said that the police would be there in 10 minutes, which for the area was actually pretty good considering their house is pretty rural. I had gotten the dogs to be quiet and put them in the closet, connected to the bathroom to make sure that she didn't hear them. 
I was trying to stay calm, and I could still hear the pounding on the window, though. As I continued to talk to the operator, I then heard the glass shatter. I cursed under my breath, trying not to cry. I mean, I was really scared and pretty much ready to cry from the fear of being beaten to death by someone who was clearly not in the right state of mind. I was whispering what was happening to the operator, hiding in the back of the bathroom in the tub, and after about four minutes of pretty much silence, I then heard footsteps, and I could see feet under the other side of the door, and I cursed to myself again. I then see Miss Rose get onto her hands looking under the crack, and I mistakenly let out a gasp. She gets up quickly, pounding at the door. I can tell that she's still using the pliers. I am at this point crying, asking the operator where the police are, to which she responds three minutes. And those three minutes, man, they felt like forever. I screamed at Miss Rose to please go away, and she screamed back that I shouldn't be here. Once I heard the sound of police cars and about a minute later them trying to kick the door down, I felt a little bit better. I was told to stay on the line till the intruder was caught and that police were not trying to get into the house. Eventually, they did get into the house though and I yelled to get their attention, not that they needed it. She was still banging on the door at this point. Once they got into the room, she was told to drop her weapon and she obeyed saying that she didn't do anything wrong. They got her in cuffs and... A police officer told me that it was okay to unlock the door, to which I slowly got up and unlocked it. After being taken to the police station and giving them my story for their report, I went to my parents' house because I was just too scared to be alone at this point. The next day, I called Mrs. Brown and explained the situation. I got full payment even after telling them that I wasn't going back to the house, they called me a few days later saying that Miss Rose was under the influence of drugs apparently and in her words she told the police that she decided to take care of the robber, me, herself and that she did nothing wrong. She was charged with breaking and entering which is kind of ironic but after that I quit dog sitting for good and am a lot more paranoid and always make sure that my doors and windows are locked these days. So, just a fair warning, I don't live in the best area, but it's close to my kid's school and it's really all that we can afford. Now, I was in line at a stoplight waiting for it to change so I could get to school to pick up my older kids. I had my toddler with me. While I was waiting, I heard my passenger side handle move like someone was trying to open it. I always lock my car doors out of habit. My car is older, so they don't lock automatically when I start the car like newer ones do. I look over and there's an older woman aggressively trying to open my door. My window has cracked a bit for fresh air, but not all the way down. She reached up trying to get the window to go down, but couldn't get her fingers in. The woman then says, uh, Excuse me, I need you to help me out. I need a ride. Now, I'm all for helping people, but not when they're trying to get into my car with no explanation like this. I mean, you just don't do that. I say, do you need me to call 911? She says, no, you need to help me. Just let me in. Come on now, help me out. Pulls on the door again. Lucky for me, the light changed and I told her, sorry, but I have to go. I, I can't help you. I drove off and after that, thankfully, I haven't seen her since. It is, unfortunately, though, the only way to get my kids to school, so I have to drive through that way about every day, and I just sure hope that I don't run into this woman ever again. So I have a friend, a 27-year-old male, who told me a fascinating story about lucid dreaming one day. He explained that his father had taught himself to lucid dream every night, a skill that I was highly envious of. His father apparently taught him how to do it when he was 15 or so, by drawing dots on his hands and looking at them throughout the day so that eventually when he was dreaming, he could look at his hand and not see the dots, allowing him to realize that he was dreaming. This is a common technique for inducing lucid dreams and something that I tried but never for long enough to actually stick to it. As a teenager, he learned to lucid dream on command, just like his father every night. 
He explained that it was more thrilling than any drug that he had ever taken because he had full control over every scenario and could construct any environment of his wildest imagination. He could have his way with any person that he imagined, obtain superpowers like flying, invisibility, teleport to any place that he wanted to, or visit alien worlds, etc. It was pure bliss and he explained to me that he ended up sleeping all throughout the day at times because his dream world was more exciting than reality. He did this every night for more than a year or so until things started to get a bit strange. You see, he told me that he started to notice a hooded figure in the periphery of his vision, but whenever he tried to look at the figure, it would walk out of his field of vision. The figure first appeared very far away in the distance from him, but every night after the first sighting, the hooded figure would return to his dream, but closer to him and still always outside of his central view. He could never really focus on the figure or see its face, so he couldn't tell if it was supposed to be human or something else. Once the figure started appearing closer to him, though, he would be filled with an overwhelming sense of dread and felt less control over his dream environment. Eventually, too, he finally felt terrified to fall asleep knowing that the figure would get even closer and seemingly harm him as he sensed the evil nature of this faceless figure. He ended up fighting sleep every night to prevent dreaming and turned into an insomniac, which he still is to this day. He told me that he doesn't lucid dream anymore and I'm not sure how he unlearned it, but he hasn't seen the hooded figure since then. It's a pretty creepy story that really stuck with me and a caveat to trying to learn to lucid dream every night. You might grow to regret it when things get out of control like they did for my friend. I'm still in contact with this friend, so if any of you guys are interested in questions for me to ask him, then I'd be happy to. Just leave them in the comment section below and I'll see what I can do. So I'm guessing on the timing, but around seven years ago, I would say, my older brother and several of his friends went on a camping trip in rural Maine. When they drove up there, they decided to stay in a random motel nearby the skiing trails. He said that it looked pretty run down and sketchy, but being college kids at the time, they didn't care too much and just wanted a cheap place to sleep for the night. After a nice day of skiing, they got some drinks at a local bar and headed back to the motel to get some rest. As they were all hanging out in their motel room, my brother opened a desk drawer to store some of his things in and what he found inside the drawer made his jaw drop in horror. There was a, a coiled ethernet cord with dried blood stains all over it. And as if this discovery wasn't terrifying enough, about an hour later, all the lights turned off all of a sudden without any warning. My brother walked outside and saw that there wasn't a single light on in the entire motel. He went to the front desk and the guy working there explained that the power had went out. It was night time at this point so everything was completely pitch black. My brother spent the rest of the night awake and scared and the power didn't turn back on until the next morning. My brother took a photo of the bloody ethernet cord but sadly I just texted him asking him if he still had the photo and he can't find it on his phone or iCloud. I really wish I could have shared that photo here because it really was quite disgusting to see. From the look of it, I could imagine that someone was brutally stabbed and strangled in that room that he was staying in perhaps. I mean, there was a lot of blood. I also think that it was pretty stupid of him that he didn't call the police and at least fill out a report about any of this. I've never really had any experiences in my life besides this one and I have a skeptical mind but am very open to the idea of the paranormal. I guess you could say that I want to believe. However, I have no explanation regarding this incident. It happened to me and a couple of friends in 2011 and I've never really told anyone other than my significant other. We were 19 and in a ghost hunting phase and had been to some reportedly haunted sites and didn't have any experiences to speak of really. But we had heard of a small abandoned village or hamlet a short way out of the city that we were told was very creepy and unsettling. Side note too, my grandma it turns out was actually born there of all places. 
It was a very small town with maybe 50 to 100 people that had abandoned it, reportedly overnight in the 50s. But we decided to go there after dark one evening. All that remains there apparently is the collapsed general store, one house and a perfectly preserved Ukrainian Orthodox church. The small house had the windows and the doors removed. We explored inside and there was still wallpaper in the bedrooms and the living room and some old kitchen items in the kitchen too. It was creepy for sure, but mainly because it was dark in the middle of nowhere. We took some videos of the inside and left shortly afterward. When we got home, we watched the videos and we didn't see anything, but we picked up something that sounded like a girl saying, please no. It wasn't clear, so I didn't really think too much of it. But something compelled us to go back a few weeks later, and this is where everything got very real. So... I decided to print off some questions in Latin because I saw a YouTube video saying that an inhuman spirit would respond to Latin, which I was like, what the heck, but hey, I'll give it a go. It was mostly to creep out another friend that tagged along this time. I was trying to be funny if I'm being honest. But the second that we drove up to the house, the feeling was just different this time. I felt dread is the only way to put it. The three of us, our one friend refused to get out of the car, decided to go back into the house and discovered that it actually had a dirt cellar this time, so we went down. It was your average dirt basement really, absolutely nothing in there except a few old broken jars really. When we went back upstairs, one friend went back to the car and I stood out on the porch leaning into the window while my other friend stood on the grass maybe 10 feet behind me. And this is when I decided to start asking the questions in Latin while recording. I asked things like, is there anything there? Who or what are you? And lastly, show yourself. And it was at this point that there was a sound from inside the house. I said it again and before I could even finish, four massively loud booms just came from nowhere. It sounded like something perhaps coming up from the basement I would guess and really fast. I screamed at this, loudly, as did the friend who was behind me, and at that we ran to the car and my one friend who was already in the driver's seat, we barely got into the car before she was peeling down the dirt road. I cried a little bit that night and I don't think that there was a word spoken by anyone after that. Now, there was no way that it was an animal or a person inside the house. It was tiny and nowhere really for an animal or a person of that size to hide. Plus, we had just been through the entire house ourselves and we for sure would have seen something that big. But there was nothing on the video other than me screaming and telling my friend to go when I got in the car. I have no clue what happened that night, but it scared me to my core. Although, I must admit that it did make me curious too. I've been to other allegedly haunted places since then, but have never had another experience or encounter like this. I haven't been back there since then and to be honest, uh, I don't really intend to return either. I've been a long time listener and I thought that it would be a, a perfect time to tell my story and I would love to hear what you guys might think and what your theories might be. So it was about 8.30pm, and while taking out the trash at work with a co-worker or roommate, a large dog approached us at some point. But the strangest thing is that it seemed to be, like, I don't know, galloping almost. It wasn't walking normally like an animal should. Despite the many surrounding lights, the dog appeared to be entirely black as well. It was sort of silhouetted just enough that you could see its muscle definition but not much more. I could also see a slight reflection in its eyes and it seemed to lack a, a shadow as well, I think. My roommate and I, upon noticing this, both expressed having different experiences and visions of the dog though. When I initially saw the dog, I interacted saying, oh, dog, in excitement. For me, I proceeded to sit entirely still on the cement, staring like a statue. But what I saw was a large, fluffy black dog, lazy ears, similar to a Newfoundland dog. My roommate expresses seeing the dog as a, a large, very muscular, aggressive looking black dog that stood rigid the entire time, staring like it wanted to attack us. It was sort of haired, muscled, and had pointed ears. 
I jokingly stated that the dog looked like a skinwalker, not really anticipating that anything would happen. But then we immediately felt a wave of dread fall over us. Something was wrong. We both saw the dog's jaw open, almost as if it was about to bark at us, and then we heard a distant yet extremely clear high-pitched come here. The dog immediately turned to take off. We turned around the corner. The creature was unreasonably far up the road for the short amount of time that it was not being observed. It was wobbling too, crossing its paws, walking oddly. When it turned left around the corner, it seemed to nearly stand up on its hind paws as well, like on two legs, just before passing around and out of sight. The rest of the night too was just as interesting. We had trouble with certain objects slightly moving place, nudging a bit, settling again. It quickly became more aggressive as well, but, but then, just as we were about to leave, we heard a loud and persistent knocking coming from the front of the store. We had a brief look, but we quickly went to our cars upon hearing it. It was such a weird night that we just thought that we should get out of there. On the drive home, I tried to blast music and ignore what I had just seen, but I heard a whispering coming from my back seat. I couldn't quite make out any of the words, but it just sounded like whistling almost. But get this, I saw a random antique clawfoot bathtub on the left side of the road in a field and it was definitely not there the day before, or even that morning on my drive there. And the kicker is that I was watching the sidelines of the roads for the animals and I most certainly saw a buck. He was leading out in front of the road a good 50 feet ahead. I slammed on my brakes, but when I got closer, it was merely a bush. I have a hard time explaining any of this, and perhaps I was just paranoid, but everything that happened that night was really weird, strange, and I don't know how to explain any of it. So last night, me and my friend decided that we wanted to go into the woods to get a little scared, so we brought some flashlights and a knife and went down to a creek in our woods for Halloween. To get the best experience, we turned the flashlights off and stood there. Both of us had an overwhelming feeling that we were being watched, so we got out of the woods. Later that night, we were hanging out on a small street near our houses and we wanted to get scared again, so we went to a dark corner of the road where it gets a, a little bit suspicious with the houses there and the woods and whatnot. We both felt the same feeling from earlier though that we were being watched, so we looked down into the woods about 50 yards away and noticed a certain part of the woods was pitch black while you could make out the rest of the woods. But the feeling started to get more ominous and... We started to feel surrounded and heard walking in the woods and leaves and stuff being crunched and twigs breaking. The silence was deafening as well and without even speaking to each other, we both had an overwhelming feeling of dread and we sprinted back up the street. But while I was sprinting, I turned to look back and for a split second I saw a girl in a white gown in the dark spot that I had mentioned earlier. She didn't have a body though and the only thing that I could make out as a body, I guess you could say, was that she sort of looked like a grey aura outlining the body. What I do remember, though, are her incredibly black eyes. We ran back to my house and couldn't even describe what we were feeling, but I know that I'm staying out of the woods for a while after that. I won't be going back for quite some time. So I'm a male, 31, and I purchased a home roughly two years ago after living in an apartment that was located right behind a cemetery. I have videos on my profile that show two of my many things that happened there. But here at the house, seems like we were either followed or what was already there just kept doing its thing. Me included, my three children, female 12, female 10, and male 5, I'm a single father. This thing does not bother them, only me for whatever reason, but it all started out about three days after we moved in. I was in the kitchen and you can sort of see the hallway that leads to the kids' room from there. I saw what looked like one of my kids run down the hall and into one of the rooms. Right after that, 
All three of my actual kids came running in from the front door from playing outside. I just thought, okay, whoa, that was weird. But after that, I would sleep in my room on the opposite side of the house from my kids' rooms, and I would feel like one of them was coming in and laying on the bed. I would look over to ask if they were okay, and when I did, nobody was ever there. On one particular night, the same thing happened, only this time I, I felt a kid's arm lay across my back. I rolled over, and what looked like a girl smaller than my daughter's jumped out of the bed and went into the bathroom. When this thing moved, I mean it moved too. It was like lightning almost. It went around 12 feet in a matter of roughly a second. Since then, it doesn't fail that at least two times a week, something paranormal happens here. You can hear a door in the house close when I'm at home and the kids are at school. The occasional voice of a man or a woman having a conversation somewhere in the house. And of course, the bed incidences. In fact, it got to the point where I had three paranormal investigators come and we all saw the girl run behind the kitchen island. And I guess it's not the scary things going on, it's all that I feel uncomfortable sleeping in my own room, so I just lay on the couch with the TV these days and a few lights on. At the corner of my eye, I could still see something darting in the hallways, but man, it's better than something climbing into your bed at like midnight three or four times in the week. So I can't really say that I believe in ghosts or the paranormal, but I did have this experience a while back that I just cannot understand. Ever since I was little, it would take me a long time to go to sleep. I'm talking like laying in bed for three hours before actually falling asleep. And this one night, a few years ago, I remember getting very annoyed because I just couldn't sleep. I'd been laying there in bed for at least four hours already. It was around one in the morning and I had to wake up at six for school, so I was really trying to fall asleep. At the time, for some reason, I was terrified to sleep in pure darkness, so I had an antique lamp on during all the hours of the night. I was well past the age where a nightlight was acceptable to have, but hey, it was my thing. I was finally drifting to sleep too when I then just heard a, a loud slam. I slowly opened my eyes, still very drowsy, being seconds away from peacefully sleeping. When clear as day I watched my bedroom door, which was formerly closed, swing open and then slam again. I watched as my door opened and slammed shut faster and faster and there was nothing I could really do besides just watch it. My lamp was on and illuminating the door so I was able to see that Nobody was grabbing the doorknob or anything. After at least two minutes of me watching my door rapidly open and close, I got kind of fed up by it and I wasn't scared at all, which is odd, I know, but I just ended up mumbling, can you like stop? The door slammed one final time and that was it. I rolled over towards the wall, my back to the door and I fell asleep. In the morning I checked my wall and I saw a hole that the doorknob left when it slammed into it, so it definitely wasn't a dream. And, like I said, I'm still not sure what to think about all of it, but nothing like that has happened since then, and yeah, it was really strange. So this story takes place back in the late summer of 2007. I was 18 years old, had graduated high school, and was looking forward to starting college in just a couple of weeks. I'm a tall guy, a bit over six foot, and was lanky in build back then. My dad and I had a, a yearly tradition of going on a trip to Reading where we'd stay at a hotel for the weekend and go to the water slides, see a movie, grab dinner from a fancy restaurant or two, and just generally have a good time away from home. It was Saturday and we'd gone to the water slides all day. Once the sun was setting, we decided that we'd go to an in and out for dinner and then had planned to go to the movies later in the evening. We were going to go and see Rush Hour 3, but on this particular occasion, my dad had gotten pretty wiped out and decided that he would just relax at the hotel. I still wanted to go to the movies and he said that it was okay. So he dropped me off at the movie theater, which was only a couple of miles from the hotel that we were staying at, and I told him that he didn't have to wait up for me 
I just walked back after the movie. While I was waiting in line, I noted that there was a surprising amount of people around my age all going to see a movie called Superbad. It was starting 10 minutes later than Rush Hour 3 and I was so curious to see what it was about that I changed that movie and it was a great time. The movie let out close to midnight and I was full of energy. The moon was full and it was warm at night in Reading, low 70s, so I was in good spirits as I started leisurely walking back to the hotel. Now, on my way back, I noticed a silver car pulling out from a nearby street. It was late and on a quieter part of the city, so there wasn't a whole lot of traffic at that time, so it was definitely notable. It sort of slow rolled up to me and the passenger window rolled down. Inside was a guy who might have been in his late 20s or early 30s if I had to guess. He was clean shaven with dark hair and decently dressed. He asked me if I needed a ride. I thought it was a little bit odd, but he was smiling and seemed friendly enough. I'd had such a good day and was still full of energy though, so I said no thanks and told him that I was just going to walk back to my hotel. His smile faltered for a moment and he asked if I was sure. I nodded, assuring him that I'd be alright. He shrugged his shoulder and asked one last time if I was certain, and I said yeah, and then I began to walk. He drove off, and I honestly thought that that was the end of it, but it wasn't. About two minutes later, I was still walking along the street, and I saw a car coming on the opposite side of the road. There was a cement driver on the center of the road, and it only had a couple of areas where cars could turn around, and I had been distracted with my thoughts, I wasn't looking for it, but I thought that it might have been the same car at first. I glanced back and I could just barely see where the road curved and the car turned around at the same intersection. It turned around, came driving back down my way and I knew that it was the same car with the guy that I'd talked to earlier. I saw him looking at me as he passed by me again. Chills went down my spine too for some reason. I began to walk faster but not too much as I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he thought that he'd forgotten something but then realized that he hadn't. Either way, I was paying attention now. Sure enough, as I walked forward, I saw him drive by on the opposite side of the road again. Any doubts that I had disappeared and now I was on edge, ready to bolt if I saw this car slow down next to me. I saw him drive by again but... Also, some other truck drove by on the opposite side of the road and his car passed me by. At this point, I couldn't see where he could turn around, but I knew the streetlights he could use weren't too far ahead either. I looked around and across the street from me were some businesses and they had bushes in front of them. I waited until I couldn't see the silver car anymore and I ran across the street and hid behind the bushes, using them for cover. I watched and waited. I tied my shoes tight as my heart was pounding, hoping that he wouldn't come by again, but he did. I saw his silver car drive by my hiding spot and let out a sigh of relief as he didn't suddenly decide to drive into the parking lot where I was, but I didn't move either. I knew that he could turn around again, so I kept waiting. He drove by again on the opposite side of the street. I then started counting for 10 minutes or 600 seconds. I decided that if I saw his car drive by, I would start again and would still be ready to run just in case. The 10 minutes went by and I didn't see this car again. So I got up, shakily made my way back to the hotel, keeping an eye out for any new cars coming my way. And thankfully, none did. My dad woke up when I got back to our hotel room and I told him what happened. He got up and took a look around the hotel parking lot before saying that we should probably lock the door, draw the curtains and get some sleep. And we left early the next day. I'm really glad that I didn't get into that guy's car that night because I just recently heard that there had apparently been a number of kidnappings in that area around that time with people getting taken after getting into seemingly friendly strangers' cars at night. And who knows, maybe... I met the kidnapper that night. So this evening I had an experience with something that's followed my wife and I through several moves that we've come to terms with, knowing that it's attached to either of us or something that we own, and that it's going to keep following us unless we do something to get rid of it. 
We simply call it the Pika, but the Pika is of unknown origin. For as long as my wife and I have been living together, 2012, we've had experiences with it too. Starting off, while we were just dating, neither of us told the other that we saw it. You know, not wanting to sound too crazy to the other. We've both had paranormal experiences separately before we got together, but it wasn't until we moved in together that things escalated a bit. We realized that the house that we were living in was haunted by more than one thing, and slowly we talked more and more about those things, and we were having matching experiences. It was great to feel validated, I guess you could say, that somebody else saw and felt and experienced the same crazy moments, but also mildly frightening because, you know, like ghosts and stuff. Well, anyway, the Pika got its name from what it does. For the most part, it's a shadowy silhouette of a person that we would catch peeking around corners or from behind furniture through windows and doorways, etc., before ducking out of view just as you turn to look at it. It doesn't always duck out of view fast enough though, and we see glimpses of it. One of its best tricks is when it peeks out at you from a mirror, like the mirror is really just another window or something. That always gives me a good scare as well. What's also been validating is that our dog has reacted to it as well on several occasions, as well as the pets of some of our roommates that we've had over the years. Through several years of different apartments and different rented homes, it's come along with us to all of them, and because it just gives us a, a bit of a jump scare and hasn't tried to harm us in any way, we've just sort of cohabited with it, I guess you could say. Well, tonight is the first time that it has severely shocked and scared me, though. I was watching a show on Netflix called The Midnight Club, pretty decent series, by the way, and I've got the lights low in the room to add to the fright factor, my wife is watching something else in another room, so it's just me, my snacks, and my comfy recliner while I'm watching. Things are getting a little intense, and I'm sort of subconsciously rocking my chair ever so slightly. The episode's gotten to a pretty visually dark scene, so I can faintly see myself in the chair that I'm in reflecting in the low light of the screen. And that was when I see a silhouette moving, rising from behind and to the right of me. As soon as I start to turn to look... I see two large, very not shadow white hands grab the side of my seat, forcibly stop my rocking, pulling the chair back, and thrust its face around the back of the chair to just inches from mine before disappearing into nothingness. That was the most physical experience that I've had with the Pika or anything, and probably any other paranormal entity that I've come into contact with as well. Not only was it very up close and personal with me, but it grabbed my seat, stopped my rocking, and jerked the seat back. Needless to say, I stopped my show and turned the lights on while I mentally processed what the heck just happened. Then, I detailed everything out to my wife before sharing it with all of you guys here. Anyway, I really don't know what to do from here. It seems like whatever this is is getting worse and... I don't understand why. What do you guys think that I should do, and have any of you guys had anything similar happen? If you have, I would love to know that I'm not alone. So, for context, this encounter takes place at the 140-year-old church that I worked at as a pastor. Apparently, when the second floor was built in 1976, a worker fell through the roof and landed on a girl who was sitting in a pew at service one day, where both of them died. Since I work as one of the two pastors, I have to go to the church every late Saturday night to prepare the church at the same time as the cleaning crew. I used to not believe in ghosts, that is, until these encounters convinced me otherwise. Anyway... The first story isn't really too freaky, but it's worth mentioning because, well, it'll make sense for the other stories. So, down in the basement of the church, there's this weird storage room area, accessed by a padlock. In this room, there are doors leading to other rooms, including the water heater and the piping. One of these rooms leads to this hallway about 5 feet wide and 40 feet long. This whole hallway is filled with old chairs and pews and 
One day I went down there to grab a chair because one of the chairs upstairs broke and at the other end of the hallway there is just a man standing there. Now here's the weird thing. The only way in and out of that room is through the locked door to the hallway which only the staff members and I know the code to. He didn't look like a staff member and unless he climbed over the chairs there's really no natural way that he could have gotten to the end of the hallway. I called out to him and then he just vanished. I later checked the security camera footage. There's a camera in every room because of a lot of recent robberies. And he had been there since the start of the footage, which was at 8pm the day before when motion was detected. I didn't open the door until around 9.30pm the day after the motion was detected, so it made no sense. Now, in this next encounter, it was with the same man, but something else was involved too. This takes place on the second floor and a few weeks after the previous encounter that I explained. I was there at around 10.20 in the morning preparing for church service which starts at 11 and I had to grab something from the kids art storage room. When I first got upstairs I saw that same man standing in the room at the end of the hallway. I went over and when I got within 5 feet of the room he vanished again. I went into the room and then as I walked in, I heard what sounded like a little girl who had whispered the words, You're mine. And the door started to slowly close and the lights started flickering. Let's just say too that this terrified me enough that I darted out of that room, which I'm pretty fast when I'm scared, and I literally jumped down most of the steps on the stairs and ran outside. Later that night, when I arrived at the church to clean, I looked up into the top floor window and... I saw a little girl up there and a man standing at the window. They both smiled and waved at me and then they vanished. After I saw that, I decided to head home after asking the cleaning crew to finish up and I promised myself not to ever go back to the church at night ever again. Now, these stories are creepy and all, but what I think is the most creepiest part is that nobody else in the church has had any experiences like this. Most of the people have heard the casual footsteps in the attic, which is unreachable for safety reasons, but nothing ever like this. So this happened last summer, late July, and it was me, my sister, and our cousins on their farm. We were sitting in the UTV with one of my cousins driving alongside the cornfield. We weren't going all that fast, so the noise coming from the vehicle wasn't that loud. And that's when we heard what sounded like either my uncle or my dad's voice coming from the direction of the field. But at that point in the year, the corn was above our head, so we really couldn't see anything. I told my cousin to stop driving for a second and asked if everyone heard that. They all nodded their heads and said what they heard, and we all heard the same sentence. I forgot what it was now because it's been so long, but it was something along the lines of come back or where are you going or something like this, which was strange because we were already far enough along the trail that no one would be near. The closest neighbor was on the complete opposite side that we were, and what really made us scared was that both of our dads had left a few minutes ago, so there was no chance that they would have been out there. Anyways... Because we were all so shaken up from that, we turned back and went inside to ask if it was possible that our dads had come back already or if they had left later than we had thought or something. And they were definitely not at the property during whatever happened. This confirmed it for us and my cousin went and got his gun and some other weapons for us to go back and investigate. We spent probably 30 minutes back there trying to find a source for what happened but we didn't find anything. I've heard other stories too of people hearing voices of other people they know or even themselves coming from another room or something when nobody's actually there. And I'm wondering if this could have been, well, one of those instances. What do you guys think? This happened seven years ago, but... I still remember the fear and I feel like it was just yesterday. When I was in my early 20s, I worked the night shift at a bakery making the donuts. I really loved that job too. Three nights of the week I would be with my co-worker and two nights I would work alone. 
It was summertime and we were having some problems with the AC, so the maintenance guy, Andy, came at night when I was on the clock to work on it. The bakery was small and crowded during the day, so it was best for him to come when it was pretty much empty. Management always let me know when Andy would be there, so it was never a surprise. At first, too, he was very pleasant and I had no issues sharing space with him as we worked. One evening, though, this changed. My one co-worker was a little bit late. She said that she lost track of time in the shower, so Andy piped in saying, we should all shower together to save time, and starts laughing at that. It was a bit creepy. I also had stated that I lived alone with his response being, good, I have you to myself then. And after this night, I realized that Andy wasn't the kind of guy that I thought that he was. I stopped speaking to him unless I had to, and before long the AC was repaired, and I thought that I was free from him. Fast forward to a night a few weeks later, I'm working alone. It's two in the morning, and I'm trying donuts, when I hear all of a sudden a loud banging on the front window. Startled, I look up and see who else but Andy. He's calling my name and asking to be let in. No one had said anything to me about him coming that night. Andy then starts pulling on the front door handles. Luckily it's locked, but man, he became pretty aggressive. I run into a corner of the bakery where he can't see me and try calling my manager with no response. The phone starts ringing and I can see the caller ID from where I'm sitting and it's Andy. He's being relentless and won't stop banging on the window and trying to pry the door open. My fear is rising now, so I dial 911. The cops arrive within 10 minutes and search Andy's vehicle, and in the back seat, they find duct tape, a knife, and rope. Apparently, they can't really do much, though, because, well, he hasn't harmed me or whatever. Andy told the police that he was there to fix the AC, but my manager calls me back in the morning and tells me that the AC is working fine, and they never asked Andy to come out. So, whatever Andy had planned that night, whatever he was there for... I know one thing for sure, it wasn't the air conditioning. Last night, my, and I'm a 22 year old female, and my husband, 25 year old male, woke me up at around 11.50 to tell me that someone has been knocking on our door and ringing our apartment doorbell for about 10 minutes on and off. He woke me so that I could possibly ID the person. Once I looked out of our upstairs apartment window, I saw the man walking to his car in our apartment parking lot. It's across the street from our unit. He was wearing blue jeans and a grey t-shirt. He was a, a medium build, I suppose. Possibly 30 years old, a blonde man. He wasn't covering his face or anything too, but the thing is, is that he was carrying what looked like resistance bands or a rope or something. He sat in his car for about three minutes while I was on the phone with dispatch. Then he came back to our door and knocked hard for another few minutes. Dispatch advised me that police were on their way and they hung up. It was at this point that I started videoing the vehicle. I read out the tag number and make and model and just watched as he put the car in park and reverse over and over again. Out of seemingly nowhere too, he backed out of the parking lot and started rushing away, but not before the officer arrived and pulled him over. My downstairs neighbor knocked on my door and told me that he had been peering into her little children's window and was pounding on her door as well. She said that her husband had left only one minute before he started knocking at her door. She said that he saw her children through the window and that's why he seemed to continue knocking. Our doors are right next to one another, so he probably didn't know what door he wanted opened. He was watching us as well through our upstairs windows, so I turned all the lights out and shut the blinds while I called dispatch. The police never contacted us for a statement. I've reached out to dispatch about an update and I'm waiting to see if any action was taken. We're keeping our eyes peeled to see if he's been following us or anything. I'm replacing my porch light bulbs with motion detectors and putting bars in our windows and door tracks and stuff. My neighbor and our families are pretty panicked to say the least because he was outside for about 25 to 30 minutes and that shows a lot of determination to get in, right? I'm still waiting on a call from the responding officer. I have his badge number and name, so 
If they don't reach out to me today or tonight, he might work third shift apparently. I'll call the substation. If they didn't do anything, I'll go ahead and make a suspicious person's case for the paper trail. We've had no odd encounters any other night. However, while I was looking at the video that I took, I remembered that car. I was walking my dog at 8pm about a week ago for him to go pee and this car was driving really slow through the parking lot and parked a few spots down from where I was letting my dog sniff. They just seemed to sit there with the car running and when I tell you my ears started ringing and I got an awful feeling, I'm not joking. In fact, it got so bad that I just turned around and went home. I didn't even give my dog a chance to pee and I shut every door and window. I think that this man has been staking out our apartment building for some time now, me and my neighbours, and I think that he wanted to get in where those children are. So I was sat in my friend's bedroom in the new house his family had just built, on the side of the old barn. We had the windows open and a soft breeze and the distant sounds of people in the park were drifting through. We were watching movies, meeting snacks, having a lazy summer holiday afternoon. There was nothing eerie or scary about any of it. No scary films, no talking of anything of the sort. But in between films, my friend got up to replenish the snacks while I was changing the disc. He called my name from the door and I was turning to answer when I felt the distinct, unmistakable sensation of like an ice cold hand tightening on my neck. I dropped the DVD case as my hands instinctively flew up to my throat to pull his hand away, but of course, my friend wasn't there. In fact, nobody was there. But this hand, it had completely restricted my breathing and I couldn't take a breath. My friend ran over in a panic and led me to the sofa to sit down while I was gasping for air, utterly terrified. He kept saying, just breathe, just breathe. Well, he fumbled for his phone and started dialing 999, which is like our 911 here in England. Then, on and off with the just breathes, I was suddenly able to take a breath. It probably lasted less than a minute, but man, I just broke down shaking and crying. I still have no idea what that was, but it felt like someone had grabbed my throat and was just strangling me. To this day, it's the only unexplainable thing that's ever really happened to me as well. I've always been enthralled by ghost stories and the tales of the unexplained, but this is my only real-life experience that I know of. I have no medical conditions or allergies or anything like that. Nothing has developed in the two decades since this happened either. Nothing that could really explain what caused this freak incident. And when I asked my friend about it years later, he said it looked like a ghost walked through me or something. Not that he saw a ghost, but... The terror on my face and how I turned sheet white and just froze like that. He said that it's something that will live with him forever. So this happened years ago when I had just moved to a new town for school. I lived with my second aunt for the first two months. But we had totally different lifestyles and I decided that it would be better if I just move out. I didn't have a lot of money, so I was initially willing to share rent with somebody. Fast forward a week and still nothing. One day I had two appointments in the same area, at 7 and 8pm, the other end of town, but the district was quite decent and not cheap. Mum was against me going there alone and so late, but I just didn't really have a choice. I arrived at the metro station in advance because I had to walk 15 minutes from there to get to the first apartment complex. The road to the complex was dark, surrounded by not-so-nice-looking buildings and almost deserted. Definitely not what I expected from the area at all. Out of nowhere, though, a, a guy approached me. He was about my age, tall, wore glasses, and had a kind of nerdy and intelligent look to him, I guess. Also out of nowhere, he stated that I must be a domestic violence victim and need help. I was so taken aback that I didn't even know what to say to that, he said that he could help. He has all the resources and I shouldn't be afraid to talk to him. I finally gained back the ability to speak and firmly told him that I'm not experiencing any DV and I don't need any help. He continued, You shouldn't be afraid of your husband. There are shelters for women that you can temporarily stay in. I'm a psychologist and I help women like you. Does he beat you? 
assault you verbally. You don't have to put up with that, you know. One word and I get social workers involved and you'll never see him again. I was shocked that anybody could assume that I was married because at the time I never even had a boyfriend. It lasted for about five to seven minutes. I kept on walking. He kept on talking. Doesn't matter how many times I told him that I don't need any help. He encouraged me to open up and not to feel afraid to tell that I wanted to be rescued from my abusive husband. There was just no way to tell him that I didn't even have a husband. He seemed to be convinced that I was a DV victim. I even considered yelling at him, but he was just so polite, well articulated, and honestly listening to him, I could believe that he was working with DV victims. Because, weird coincidence, but that's exactly what my mum's job is, and I'm quite familiar with the terms and techniques that he was using. Honestly, he didn't seem intimidating, and... I wasn't scared by his presence or weird assumptions, just it was so bizarre and out of place that I merely wanted him to leave me alone and wondered if he was going to walk me all the way to the apartment complex, and if so, what happens if he mistakes my potential landlord that was already waiting for me at the porch for my abusive husband? Thankfully though, he left earlier. He tried to give me his business card as a last attempt to save me. I firmly denied again and finally he walked away. I got to the apartment, long story short, didn't like it, it was too expensive, not really worth the price, plus the weird guy that most likely lived nearby and all that. But the second appointment was 20 minutes from there and I liked the neighborhood much more, well lit, felt safer, lots of shops, people walking by. I got to the building 30 minutes early and decided to walk around, and check out the porch that I have to wait on for the girl that I need to talk to. Then the second encounter happened. Two people, a guy and a girl, exited the porch. I meet the guy's eyes for a brief moment and he stops completely, looking at me in some kind of awe or... I don't know how to describe it to be honest. I thought maybe he recognized me from somewhere at first but it seemed unlikely. I didn't know anyone in this city except for my aunt and classmates and he wasn't any of them. I'd never met him before in fact. So, I made sure it was the porch that I needed, texted the girl who was supposed to show me her apartment, and she replied back that she was going to be late. Great, I thought. I started walking around the courtyard back and forth, still feeling the guy's eyes on me. He was standing nearby talking to the girl that he exited the porch with. His head slightly moved as I moved across the courtyard. Finally, I got tired of it and I decided to check if he's really following me everywhere that I go. I chose a moment when he wasn't looking at me and made a run, getting behind the building and hid in a bush. And one minute later, I see him. He gets behind the building too, but isn't able to find me. Then he literally stands on his tiptoes, slowly moving his head to the right, to the left, trying to spot me it seems. His lips are moving too and I hear, where is she? I felt goosebumps all around my body. He left. I still stayed and waited for the girl to come because I was afraid that she'd give me a, a bad review on a site that we were using, but even after we finally met, she said that she forgot the keys and we need to wait for the other flatmate. We sat on a bench, chit-chatting for another 30 minutes, and only then walked to the building. And there was the guy with this girl again, still standing. I saw his eyes practically burning a hole in me this time, and he smiled, or rather grinned widely and with some kind of evil pleasure almost. I still remember his grin because I've never seen anything like that. We walked past him and my potential flatmate showed me the apartment, although at that moment I already knew that we weren't going to live together, which was a pity because I really liked the place, but oh well. That guy, with him being there on the same porch, chances are that he lived there too. Honestly, I don't remember what happened in the apartment because it was years ago. Something tells me I asked the girls that lived there about this guy, but I don't think that their reply was of significance. They either brushed it off and I decided not to push it or I never asked them in the first place. I also don't remember if I saw him when I was exiting the building, but I know for a fact that nobody followed me to the metro station and I've never seen this guy again. I don't know what his deal was and... I'm not sure if I want to. I also never returned to that cursed area as of now. But it was weird. Two really eerie and creepy encounters in one night. I don't know if I was being set up or 
if something else was going on or if it was just a, a really strange coincidence, but something tells me that there was a plan there that day, that multiple people may have been involved and that somehow my ability to get away from these people at just the right time may have saved me from something that day. What that is, I still don't know. This experience took place in the spring of 77 when I was five years old. My mother had a friend named Nikki who had invited us to spend the weekend at her house. Vicky's house was not some rundown, obviously haunted home that you would expect for a story like this. It was actually a newer two-story build that was less than 10 years old. But while the house did not give off any weird vibes, I remember that Vicky wasn't exactly the nicest woman either, and always seemed to be giving my sister and I trouble, like she was thinking we were going to damage something by being kids. Anyway, in Vicky's basement she had one of those hanging half-basket wicker chairs that were popular in the 70s. I was down in the basement sitting on this chair, being very careful as I didn't want to give Vicky another reason to tell me off, when suddenly... The chain or the rope that fastened the chair to the ceiling broke and it fell forward on the open side, trapping me inside of it like a cage. At the same time that I fell to the floor, Vicky's stereo suddenly turned on by itself and started playing very loud music. I was utterly terrified and screamed for my mother. My mother and Vicky came rushing down the stairs and my mum got me out from under the chair while Vicky shut the stereo off. Vicky then started laying into me for breaking the chair and playing with the stereo, but my mum told her to shut it. We left shortly afterwards when I had calmed down too. But to this day, I can vividly remember the feeling of terror as that chair fell on top of me and the stereo just came on loudly like that. When I brought it up to my mum years later, she remembered the incident and took us home because she didn't think it was possible for me to turn on the stereo and managed to break the chair in the time that it took between the stereo coming on and me screaming for her. It was basically instantaneous is what she said. She thought Vicky was acting terribly the entire time and yelling at me for the incident was the last straw and we never went back to Vicky's again after that. I can't say that I'm at all heartbroken about it either. There was something weird about that house, and I don't know, I just felt like something was in it, and it didn't like me for whatever reason, and it wasn't just Vicky. This story happened three years ago when I was 15 in my village. I really don't tell this story much too, because, well, people tend to think that I'm making it up but I've been thinking about it quite a lot this week and I don't know, I just feel like I need to tell some people. So my village is located in a pretty rural area that is protected by the government because it's been considered a natural paradise for like the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it's forbidden to cut down trees which means that it's a huge forest. I was spending my summer there and my favorite thing to do was hiking and although I had never gone alone in the woods, just roads with people, my grandma had told me that cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for like the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I would go to the nearest town, one hour away by foot, by the only way that I knew, the road and on my way back from seeing friends there, I decided to take the new path that my granny said was safe alone. But that was a pretty big mistake. So the first part of the path was the easiest, with just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to get up. I literally had to climb on like four legs like a dog, and when I got to the top, I looked around and even found some animal bones as well. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor where the woods really began, so it was a big relief until I got to a sort of dead end. There were some huge trees that had fallen exactly on a row on the path and... 
It was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me as well because there were no other fallen trees. And the weirdest part? Aside from those trees, there was also a, a little barn there. Yeah, a barn in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn and then I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing, that the field had no trees in it. It was completely clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental, how there casually was a barn beside with a clear field when the path had been closed for like 30 years. The whole thing just seemed really off. I went on though and luckily I was reaching the last hill my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village, when suddenly there was complete silence in all the woods, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself that it must have been a bird or something, but then they came closer, and they really sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself that it was probably just an animal, I was so afraid that I couldn't look back. I started walking faster, and guess what? So did the footsteps. I started running after noticing that, and so did the footsteps again. I was running for my life at this point, when suddenly I started hearing incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I was really close. I got onto the patio of the first house that I could find, closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for like 10 minutes until I got my breath back. And then I went back home. I really don't know what that was, but I get chills just remembering that place. Not having a signal on my phone in the middle of nowhere and the grunts. It makes me think too that there was something following me that day since the barn and the trees were just a, a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that and I don't intend to ever again either. This happened in August of 2021. My parents were out for the night. It was just me and my sister home. This was in Manchester, UK. It was around 1 in the morning and I was sat in my kitchen eating food and on my phone. I hear two taps on the window and look up and there was a man in a balaclava waving a knife around. It didn't really scare me at first. I think I just started swearing and asking who are you? I live in an area where people casually flash knives around. But he didn't say anything and was just sort of scoping out the kitchen like he was looking for something. And he asked how's my sister. Then a few seconds later my front doorbell rings and the man says someone's at the door. I don't know how he heard the doorbell because I mean it's hardly noticeable from the kitchen let alone outside. But that's when I was pretty terrified because... My front door was actually unlocked. I quickly grabbed a knife and walked towards the front door. I can see if someone has stood there because there's a glass panel in it. But nobody was there. I quickly locked the door and went back to the kitchen. And the man was gone. Instantly I thought about my sister and I ran straight up to her to check on her because it really spooked me out how he asked about her and she was thankfully fast asleep. I shut her window and checked every window and made sure every door was locked. I don't know why, but I didn't think to call the police at the time. Instead, I just sort of waited up all night and waited for my parents to get back to report it. My mum always shouted and lectured me whenever I left the doors open, even in the day. She's just really paranoid, but I tell you, after that, I triple check every door now.
So my girlfriend has a younger sister who unfortunately has cerebral palsy and autism too. And although she's very smart, she can't really support herself fully and will probably need help and guidance for the rest of her life, which is perfectly fine. She's basically our adopted daughter. My girlfriend taught her sister how to walk and talk and basically everything that she knows. But one day, my girlfriend told me how there were three instances in her life where her sister basically sort of broke character and told her how she was stuck and couldn't get out and that she was trapped and needed help desperately. Her sister talks in a very sort of specific kiddish and cutesy way. She's very innocent and to this day, at 19 years old, talks to her stuffed animals like as if they're real. But during the three times where she broke character, my girlfriend told me that her sister spoke in a certain desperate and adult tone and made a face like she was scared for her life and literally the next second her face would change and she would go back to the way that she was before. And my girlfriend told me that it would be like her sister didn't remember what had just happened moments ago. To this day, it scares her and makes her wonder what if her sister is trapped in a, a childlike state and sometimes has moments of like clarity or something. I'm not sure, but when she told me, I could tell that it was serious and she's never brought it up ever since because of how much it creeps her out. Sometimes I get worried that one day she might break character with me and only I'll be around and I won't know what to do. She's very sweet and we love her just the way that she is, but it really creeps me out to think that, I mean, what if her mind was being held hostage by another? So... I've had encounters with a paranormal stuff, I guess you could call it, in this house, but I've never experienced anything like this. A lot of other stuff has ended thanks to a local priest that we had come over, a good sage of smudging and stuff like that. It's currently 1.47am here where I live, and I got up to go to the bathroom and left the light off. For reference, I haven't gone to sleep yet, and I'm not really tired as I'm always up late anyway. But every night when I go to the restroom, I, I just have a tendency to peer through the blinds and look in the backyard to see what's up. I'm just a bit nosy, I guess, but there's nothing ever in the woods. Only really the woods themselves behind me for about seven or eight miles. But when I looked out this time, I saw something and I have no idea how to even describe what it was. I'll do my best. It had pale skin, greyish, tall, like really tall, probably at least seven feet, exaggerated features, legs were slim and super long, arms hung down past the knees, kind of sort of hunched over as well. I didn't get a super good look at it because it was walking back into the woods when I saw it, but this thing was not like any animal I know of. Here in Rhode Island, our animals are pretty standard looking, but its movement was very rubbery, like it moved without real motion, almost like it was in pain, I guess. I'm a bit of a skeptic, but man, that was the most terrifying thing that I've ever seen. I guess my only question is, what on earth was it? So, to cut a, an extremely long story short, my friend used to live in a house that was well in the woods, and one day he told me something was happening around his house, so I spent the night there to see what was going on. We sat with our backs to the wall and the window cracked just a bit, second story. As we're talking, we started hearing strange noises coming from the woods. We were shocked though as we peeked to see what it was, because between his house and the woods was this big open area, and we could faintly see the open area because of the moonlight, but, but we couldn't see the pitch blackness of the woods, when suddenly some large white creature that looked like a naked man creeped out. It was bald, and its eyes were glowing. When we freaked out, I yelped a bit too loud because it stopped and went back into the woods. 
The next day, being the curious people that we were, we decided to go into the woods and search. Eventually, we found a strange uprooted tree with a bunch of holes in the ground. We heard heavy breathing coming from inside somewhere, but we decided not to go looking in there. A few weeks went by and nothing really happened. I came back to his house just to sleep over and he asked me to go grab one of the bikes off the back porch. I went back there through the garage, but as I was grabbing it, I don't know why, but I, I just felt like something was watching me. I looked off toward the woods, but saw nothing when suddenly I heard a, a strange noise literally over my head. I looked up at the roof, which was only about seven feet off the ground in that section of the house due to the elevation of the porch, and I saw a similar creature sitting on the roof just feet from my face. When I panicked, it shrieked in my face and I ran back into the garage and slammed the door shut. My friend ran into the garage from inside the house to see what happened and I was just panicking, telling him to lock everything right now. We locked ourselves inside and waited for his dad to come back. This was around 6 to 8 p.m. I don't remember exactly, but it was closer to the night. His dad was in the military and decided to step out and take a look after he came home, and we told him what happened. And he saw that same creature in the distance, just on the edge of the woods, but had no explanation for it. It's been five years since what happened, and now I've been seeing sightings of things just like it all over the place. YouTube, Reddit, Facebook, you name it. It's been really haunting me lately thinking back on that sound that it made when it shrieked and also the, the way the thing just looked. It was terrifying. Its eyes seemed very strange too. I kind of tied two and two and figured that it must live beneath the ground somewhere and only came up when it was dark or something. I don't know. Anyway, the reason why I'm sharing this is because I was just wondering if anyone else has witnessed anything like this. If you have, then please, do let me know. So, this all started when I was 12 years old. I really don't remember how it came to this, but one day, me and a couple of my younger friends were walking out from our block of flats, and... I saw something with the corner of my eye. I still don't know what it was. It was just standing in the corner. It was tall and though I only saw it for a brief second, I experienced literal existential fear and pushed myself and my buddies outside as quickly as possible. Them not understanding what had just happened, obviously. We discussed the situation a little, speculated about what was up, but it still wasn't a big thing at that time. We just went on with our day doing, well, whatever kids are usually doing. And it would be fine if it ended with that, but it didn't. You see, after that, three of us started, well, seeing things. Well, maybe two of us, because the other one is a known liar, and I'm not here to tell lies. I know for sure some of you will consider me a liar, but anyway, that's up for you to decide. It wasn't anything clear, though, but... You would just sort of walk home in the evening and suddenly see someone dark and tall standing behind a tree. You knew that something was there and it was watching you, but you would think that maybe your mind is just messing with you sort of thing. But soon enough, it went really surreal. All I can say is that we all became pretty paranoid, I guess, feeling like we were being watched all the time. But naturally, being kids, we also became really curious. And that was the point when we began hunting this stuff. And I'm not kidding, we called ourselves hunters because we would walk all over our area late in the evening, inspecting every dark corner, seeking out the paranormal. I know for sure that most of the experiences were just scared kids, their imagination and stuff. Especially considering the fact that we would bring in someone new who did not experience this stuff previously in order to scare them. This was kind of a bait for whatever haunted us, I guess, because we hoped that it was drawn to fear. But two encounters, they stand out as very real. Stuff like, I saw it standing next to my bed when I woke up at night for a couple of seconds, and it pushed my back when we were on a hunt. 
but when I turned around, nobody was there. And even it started loudly chanting something on my ear, even though nobody was there, won't be included, although it happened. I can't really remember most of the smaller stuff anyways, but I mean, I'm 20 now and it's been a long time. But the first one occurred when I got us two walkie-talkies so we could split onto two teams and inspect the area more efficiently, I guess. This time, however, we were hanging out in the yard and playing with only one of them. The other one was right there with us, turned off. And that's when someone else appeared on our usual frequency. We heard, I guess, strange noises is the best way to describe it. And I started repeatedly asking who was this third person on the line. For some time, it was just dead silent. But then someone finally said, they're calling for you. Nothing more, and then silence. This was pretty scary on its own, because the strange thing is, in five minutes, all three of us were called home almost simultaneously. Me and one of the guys got a call from our parents, the other one was approached by his father directly, and that's when we got paranoid over one more thing. Maybe our parents are under the influence of what we thought to be a demon as well. I know that we were probably overthinking it. We were kids, right? And it was just a coincidence, but... I mean, it was weird. But I guess when you're scared, you can't really think straight, right? But the second one was worse, to say the least. This time, there were two of us. And I swear that I would think that I was hallucinating if I wasn't on my own, but... We were heading to our usual place of hunting, a dark street between a block of flats. Please bear in mind that I'm from the Ukraine, and it's not some fancy building, but like a Soviet nine-story panel one, wildly overgrown with trees and all that. And on the other side is a sort of semi-abandoned factory. It's not clear if it is in use or not, but once in an eternity we could see its pipes steaming, though everything around it is covered in metal scrap and trash. Anyway... Our casual talk was interrupted when I suddenly stopped to stare into the bushes. My friend joined me and now we both stared at something that we couldn't exactly understand. It was something white, just sort of floating at around three meters high. Not see-through like a ghost, but like solid white. And when I think back about it, it almost seemed like we were hypnotized, I guess, because I don't remember any thoughts coming through my head. I wasn't trying to process what I saw, I guess. Just sort of looking at it. And then, it frowned. Now, I know that that sounds weird. I don't even know how to describe exactly how it frowned while having no distinct features. But it felt like its skin, if you could call it that, wrinkled in a way to express anger. It took us a couple more seconds of stupor before I woke up from it, I guess you could say, punched my friend in the shoulder, and we ran somewhere people could see us as quickly as we could. Nobody was around though, so the best option was to stay somewhere someone would possibly notice us from a window. I was quietly, sort of hysterically laughing from all of the adrenaline, I think. It felt like I finally saw something unimaginable, and we almost just died at the same time. Thinking about it now, though, this thing would probably end us if it could or wanted, I guess. And I know that it sounds unbelievable, but yeah, we went back. Yeah, yeah, I know. Nobody would do that, right? That's bull. Yeah, all that stuff. But I was just curious if it had a body. Here's the thing, though. It was so dark that I couldn't even distinguish anything below its supposed head. So, we grabbed some rocks and sticks and we went back. And believe it or not, it was still there, though a little bit closer to the path that we were standing on this time. It wasn't moving, just like us for a moment, because it was terrifying. Truly, we didn't know what we were dealing with. We were just impulsive, stupid kids. But, we still threw whatever we grabbed at this thing, barely reaching the bushes at all. And it reacted by stretching its neck, skin, or whatever it was, 
tightening on its tendons or whatever they were called. And at this point, our fright reached its peak and we finally ran away. Now, this demonical nonsense went on for some time, a couple of years I would guess, but at some point, and I have no idea why, everything just sort of ended. I don't know how, I, I don't know exactly when, I don't know why, maybe because we got older or something and we weren't as sensitive to the paranormal stuff or because we were getting more and more brave bringing kitchen knives now and crosses and all that stuff to try and protect ourselves. But maybe this thing just got bored of us and moved on or something. Like I said, I don't know, but I know that I saw it. That much I'm sure of. And maybe almost everything that we thought happened was just our imagination. But those two instances, they were definitely real. Quite honestly too, I would die to know what that thing was and what it wanted from us. It made a couple of years of my life feel like an absolute mess and it would be nice to sort of, I don't know, sort these memories out, to understand what the heck we were dealing with because sometimes it seems like I'm just an idiot who can't get over the games that we played as a kid and with nobody to consult with, I I think I just guess to prefer not to mention this part of my life to anyone because I know how crazy it sounds. Sometimes I, I hope to see this tall thing again just so that I could know that what I saw was real. So this takes place in southeast Texas within a hundred miles of Houston. I was in college but had moved back to my parents for a semester after some uh, some roommate drama. My parents lived out in the country though, miles outside of town with some acreage. The land in the back of the house consists of four zones really. You've got the backyard with the nice St. Augustine, the back back which is the section of the woods that my parents cleared of underbrush and kept fairly maintained the back 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 which is a sort of clearing that we use to go back and do bonfires and parties in high school and then there's the woods after high school my parents kind of gave up on keeping back the brush and weeds from anything except their nice backyard section so imagine a big backyard fenced by a wall of tall weeds and large trees that goes back a while and then a field of giant weeds transitioning into solid dense woods with oak, pine and other trees and all that. Uh, I should also mention that I had this dog that my parents let me keep outside. They had a big chain link dog run that she lived in since my parents had no parameter fencing besides some barbed wire at the very back of the property. And this dog was not the type to stay in one spot. In fact, she was aggressive to other dogs too always going after them, acting tough, and I sometimes worried that she'd get out and kill the neighbor's chickens or something. But she was about 60 pounds and not a jumpy or scared dog at all. Now, since I was in college, I had no curfew or anything and would always come home late at night, early morning, after hanging out with friends or studying or whatnot. On this particular night, it was pretty cold out. 50 is cold here. Can't tell me different either. And even though she had a house and had a bed and straw out there, I felt bad for my dog, so I decided to bring her in to sleep in the garage. I should have been more careful because this happened quite a bit, but somehow this dog just always got the better of me. She would wait in the back until the gate was unlocked and I was in the run, gate closed with unlocked horseshoe latch, run around me and pop the gate latch with her nose and bolt off. So of course... She did this and me being who I was, was left standing in the run in the cold in the middle of the night. I was angry too because I knew that I had to go and find her and bring her back at this point. The moon was pretty bright that night and I had seen her fly into the weed wall and disappear so I followed her in without a light, called her name and there were some little trails through the weeds that we tried to keep open so we could access the property but these were less wide than a person can walk and the weeds were about maybe a head taller than me so it was pretty dense. Anyway, I'd gone a ways and had passed through the wooded section out into the clearing, solid weeds, five or eight feet tall. 
and I get quiet listening, trying to hear sounds of where she might have been at. When I hear intermittent rustling out towards the woods, which at this point uh, just a real dark outline at the edge of the weed jungle. The rustling wasn't the sound I expected since she usually just crushed through the woods and in my head I'm thinking, what the heck is she doing now? I honestly thought that she was probably rolling around in some dead skunk or something and I was going to have to bathe her. Figuring though that it was just my wild dog again, I made my way toward the noise, calling out her name again. As I got closer, it became apparent though that the rustling was not the sound of an animal charging through underbrush, but more like something intentionally shaking the trees. Like if you would grab a branch and shake it, and all the connected trees and vines would shake too. I was close enough now to make out individual branches silhouetted at the top of the tree line, and I could see that whatever was going on was causing the trees to shake all the way up to the top as well. This was off, and decidedly not my dog prancing around. I shut up and froze. Now, I hear in all of these stories people talking about how when they notice the woods go silent, and I can't remember if this happened or not, but as I stood there, I clearly heard two or three loud, deep huffs. And I guess it, it kind of sounded like a, a bull, but maybe with a, a deeper fluttering to it. Not like the tonal sounds a cow makes, but the deep, heavy exhale when they're defensive. And seemed to come from around my head height, I guess. For some reason, my mind registered that this thing was a lot closer to me than the tree line. I also remember the distinct feeling that this noise, it was directed at me. It was at this point too that I got this terrible feeling in my gut, like whole body fear and I panicked. Rational or not, I yelled my dog's name with all fear and urgency. You know how your voice gets higher and louder at the end? Well, I did that and turned and I just ran as hard as I could. Either my dog heard my tone and got scared or she was scared of whatever was on that tree line because... As I crashed through the weeds, she came up on my left from a creek and flew past me like a bullet. When I got to the open garage, she was trying to get into the back door to the house, jumping on it like a crazy animal, which was really unlike her. I closed the garage but put her in the kennel and after that, I went to bed. Now, I don't know what it was and at the time I think I convinced myself that it was one of those hogzillas that you hear about on the news from time to time. I've been around plenty of cattle and I've never heard one make a noise quite like this one. Not saying that it couldn't have been, but something just didn't feel right. This was like 10 years ago, but I know for sure that I'm still going to think real hard about it, even if I never have to go back out there alone at night again. So this happened when I was maybe 13 or 14. I want to believe that this was just a dream, but something inside of me says that it happened. So I'm from Eastern Slovakia in a city that isn't necessarily very religious but it has a lot of stories about demons and unholy things, I guess. We have one specific legend about a demon that mirrors whoever is looking at it, but I never really believed in any of this stuff. We lived in a small Slavic house, and I shared a room with my brother and two sisters. One night I was in bed and having trouble sleeping, just sort of lying there wide awake, and after what seemed like a couple of hours, I decided to go to the bathroom. But we didn't have a bathroom inside, so you had to go out the front door and around the house to go to the outhouse. I get up and step over my brother to leave my room and go out the front door. I grab my glasses on the way out so I can see clearly outside, so I know I wasn't just mistaking things for my bad vision. And as soon as I step outside, I turn to the left to go around the house, and suddenly I'm face to face with, well, myself maybe two meters in front of me. It's clearly me as well. Same face, same age, same glasses, 
wearing different clothes than the ones that I was wearing, but still clothes that I owned. And we stared at each other, both wide-eyed and in shock, neither of us moving. After maybe five full seconds, I would guess, he just turned around and casually walks around the corner of the house. I'm frozen in place, I know that I'm not dreaming, and after a minute or two, I slowly walk around the corner, and there was nobody there. Just the outhouse, maybe 50 meters away. I go to it, and I pee real fast, and go back inside and get in bed. I lay awake, confused, and rethinking what just happened. But eventually, I, I fall asleep. I don't know how long it was, too, but I woke up at some point to somebody yelling... I sit up startled, and my brother, eight or nine years old at the time, comes running back in the room yelling all types of expletives at me. He's freaking out, pacing back and forth in our room. Me and my now awake sisters try to calm him down and ask what happened, but he looks like he's having a psychotic breakdown. After a few minutes, we get him to calm down and talk to us about what happened. He says that he went outside to use the bathroom, and as soon as he got out the door, he came face to face with himself. And he told the exact same story as what I had experienced. My sisters tell him that he's just tired and seeing things. It was just a bad dream. I never said anything to him. He said that he didn't want to go pee anymore and he just got into bed. We all went back to sleep at this point and... To be honest, I, I never told anyone about my experience, ever. In fact, I hadn't even thought about it until this day. It's been over a decade and I'm living in Salt Lake City now. I woke up this morning next to my girlfriend who's still asleep and I go about my morning, set up and put up my contacts, I brush my teeth, do normal stuff. I decided to go to the gym before my girlfriend wakes up so I get ready and leave my house. I go down the stairs and out to the parking lot, but as soon as I turn to the left to go towards my car, there I am again, but this time I'm not face to face. The other me is maybe a hundred meters away behind a car. I start walking towards him, never taking my eyes off of him. We are sort of staring at each other again. I get to maybe 40 meters away and I can clearly tell that it's myself. And what makes me more certain is that he's wearing a green jacket that I had in the passenger seat of my car. It's not easy to mistake and at about 20 meters away, he turns and walks behind the cars. I lose sight of him for just a brief second. I get to my car and look in the window and my jacket is no longer on my seat. I look around but there's nobody there. I am so freaked out by this point that I just go back to my apartment and I get back in bed. I know that I'm not dreaming because I'm clearly wide awake at this point. But what I don't know is that if this is real or maybe I'm just having some sort of a, a weird hallucination. So... The creepiest thing just happened to me. I, a 24-year-old female, am laying in bed scrolling through TikTok after a long day of work. As I was scrolling, I noticed breakthrough sounds that were not part of the original audio. I confirmed this by scrolling away and scrolling back to the videos and realizing the sound wasn't there anymore. It started as little sort of blips that I assume were just caused by our terrible download speeds. As I kept scrolling though, I started hearing more and more until one entire video's audio was completely covered by what sounded like listening to TV over the phone. I got creeped out and paused the video, but the sound continued. I could hear someone breathing and eating what sounded like potato chips through my phone. I immediately covered my phone, the TV and the eating sound stopped at that point. And I was left with that sort of static that you can hear when somebody is silently on the other side of the phone. When I uncovered my camera, the chips quietly returned. I covered my camera again and, after sitting in two full minutes of phone static, asked hello. There was a, a short, low sound that I assumed to be a grunt and the phone static 
suddenly ended. I panicked, closed all my apps and turned off my phone. Now I have tape covering my camera and I just bought a VPN. I know that it's virtually impossible for the iPhone camera to be hacked but still I'm freaked out and I have no idea what's going on. My roommate just got home from dinner and told me that she's heard the same sounds before and we're both pretty sure that it's probably a weird Bluetooth thing with our or somebody else's headsets because we live around a lot of people who work from home. We're changing all of our passwords though and keeping our front cameras covered just in case because to be honest I'm still not sure who the heck that was or how on earth they were listening through. For as long as I've known my wife, she's mentioned growing up in a haunted house. I always assumed that she was just joking because she always brought it up in a, a quite light-hearted way, I guess, and never went into much detail. It was a big old house and I figured that she was just talking about weird old house noises. The house belonged to a great aunt who raised my wife for most of her childhood. Her great aunt recently passed away and her great aunt's daughter, who my wife calls her aunt, though technically she's a second cousin or something, I'll be referring to her as her aunt though, now owns this house. After my wife's great aunt passed though, we went to stay in the house for four nights to attend the funeral and spend time with my wife's family as we live in another state. When we got there, my wife and her aunt were chatting and mentioned that they thought that my wife's great aunt might join the ghosts already haunting this house. And to be honest, I still hadn't considered that they might actually be serious. The first night that we spent there, I woke up in the middle of the night and noticed something standing in the corner of the room beside the door. Thinking that it was my wife, I asked what she was doing. And this woke my actual wife up who was actually sleeping beside me. I said that I thought that I saw someone in the room with us, but it must just be my eyes playing tricks on me. She then said, the person in the corner next to the door? Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. I almost wet myself. I thought that there was some creep in my room, to be honest, and my wife was just too sleepy to process it. So I grabbed my phone to call the police but when my phone lit up the room I saw that there was nobody there anymore. There wasn't even a weird shape that I might have mistaken for a person. The door was closed so it wasn't like there could have been someone there who left the room in the moments that I was looking away to grab my phone. My wife told me that it was common to see shadowy people in the night but I shouldn't worry because they don't do anything apparently. She fell back asleep right after that, but I just laid there awake the whole night, wondering what the heck had just happened. The next morning, I asked my wife about it, and she said that she wasn't kidding about the house being haunted. People who spend the night in the house regularly see and hear ghosts, but they've never heard anyone or caused any problems, apparently. I remained skeptical even after the next night, which had been after the funeral, and my wife and aunt both reported that they'd been visited in their dreams by my wife's great aunt. So far in my mind, everything was weird but explainable, I guess. That the figure in the room could have been a strange trick of the light. My wife and her aunt had just attended the funeral of their loved one and it made sense for them to both dream about her that night. But maybe it was a coping mechanism. But the third night... I was kept awake for hours by the constant sound of footsteps pacing around the house. My wife also heard them but said that it was normal and I shouldn't worry and she fell asleep easily. A few times during the night I got up to look around for the source of the noise. I even did a, a couple of laps of the outside of the house in case there was somebody outside but I never saw anyone walking around. At one point I was in the lounge room and heard footsteps from the kitchen and called out to ask if there was anybody there. My wife's aunt opened her bedroom door and said that she could hear the footsteps too. And just like my wife, she told me that it was normal and there was no cause for concern. Then there was the sound of a drawer opening in the kitchen 
which we both reacted to, and I went to check it and found the cutlery drawer open. My wife's aunt, who had come to the kitchen too, simply closed the drawer, commented with mild annoyance that the ghosts are always leaving things open, and went back to bed, leaving me to my own existential crisis. I just could not come up with a way to explain that away. We both heard the footsteps, both heard the drawer open at the same time, and there was nobody there and no way out of the kitchen except for past us. I tried staying on the couch to try and catch this mystery walker, and there were multiple times that I heard the footsteps pass through the lounge room, but I never saw anything. Eventually, I just gave up and I went back to bed. Nothing really happened the final night, though we did wake up to several cabinets open and nobody remembered leaving them open, though that could be explained by somebody just forgetting, I guess, or even sleepwalking. Even so, the footsteps, they still bothered me, and the shadowy person from the first night and the cabinets opened on the final night made me nervous in light of everything that happened on the third night. Up until now, I've always scoffed at the idea of the paranormal, but I just can't reconcile my experiences in that house with my skepticism. Talking to my wife's family revealed that everyone who stayed in that house believes that it's haunted, because they've had at least one completely unexplainable experience there. They all report that the ghosts leave people alone for the most part, though some who have lived there for a long time as children, including my wife and her aunt, have described meeting people that they thought were probably ghosts and have positive but strange interactions with them. To be quite honest as well, I'm still not sure what to think about it. This experience took place about maybe 10 years ago now. It was while I was babysitting my baby cousin at my grandmother's house. Just to quickly explain the layout to her house as well, it has multiple levels. The main level with the kitchen, living room, two bedrooms, and a bathroom has two sets of stairs. One goes up to the master bed or bath. The other goes down to the den or laundry and a sunroom. From the den, there's another set of stairs that goes to the finished basement. This experience took place on the main level in the living room. I had the baby on my lap, just sort of playing. There was nobody else there, and out of nowhere, there was suddenly a crying coming over the monitor, and I could also hear the crying throughout the house, coming from my grandmother's bedroom upstairs, which is where her crib and the other monitor were. I immediately carried the baby and myself straight outside, going right past the stairs to the upstairs bedroom to the set going down to the den and out the sunroom door, hearing the cries the whole time. But we stayed outside until my grandmother got home. I have no explanation and it has baffled me all these years as to what happened that day. Had I only heard it from the monitor, I'd say possibly interference from another monitor close by, but... I distinctly heard it so clearly from upstairs and it carried and was even louder as I passed by it to get outside. I am still troubled by that day. So I was 26 at the time and also I'm a lady. I needed gas and it was around 11pm on a Saturday. I pulled into a busy gas station to fill my tank up, except it was completely bare, not a car in sight. I also live in Alaska, and it was very cold this night, maybe negative 10 I guess. But I was tired after working and just wanting to get home. Usually I start my pump and sit in my car due to the freezing cold, but this time I had a weird feeling that I just needed to stand by the pump, so I did. I just started pumping my gas when a little gold sedan pulled up right next to me. A guy got out and I was feeling hypervigilant for some reason. He started cleaning his completely clean windows and as he put back the squeegee he started towards me. I felt like I wanted to run but I stayed calm and continued pumping. He asked me if I would help him put his windshield wiper fluid in his car because he ran out and he doesn't know how to open the hood. I laughed it off and told him that I don't know either, which was actually a lie. 
but he kept getting closer and closer to me while trying to lure me to his car by saying that there's something under his seat that he can't reach because he's too big. Now, I'm 5'2 and petite. This man was large and scruffy. I think Alaska wilderness dude. And at this point, I'm freaking out and I hit the cell button on the pump. He took a step back and started to go back to his car and I thought that I was being smart. My gas is almost done. I looked into his car when I noticed that the insides of the doors, they had no handles except for the driver door and that really freaked me out. I was putting the pump back and opening my door. He was right behind me, slammed my door shut and yelled, you're coming with me. Obviously, I refused and I was petrified. He grabbed my arm and slammed me against my car and I elbowed him as hard as I could. I started to scream at the top of my lungs and thank God for the gas attendant with a big gun that night because if not for him, I don't know what would have happened to me. The attendant pulled the video and we made a police report. I called immediately after that guy took off and I never heard anything else about it after that night. And I guess the best that I can hope for is that he didn't get some other girl alone like I was. So, I've always had... Uh, incredibly weird paranormal experiences throughout my life but this one definitely tops the charts it unnerves me even to this day i moved to texas but i had to fly to utah to pick up my car it's february of 2020 and i leave utah at approximately 6 p.m with a friend who flew with me we decided that we'd spend the night in albuquerque so we could get some sleep and we'd arrive there at around 4am. So we're driving, things are fine, and you have to pass through a reservation to get to the main highway for Albuquerque and something felt just off from the second that we entered into New Mexico. It's maybe 2 or 3 in the morning at this point and my friend was fast asleep with her head against the window while I played the music loudly. We had to drive slowly as the speed limit was only like 35 or 45 here. And as we got further into the reservation, I heard a, a sharp knock on the roof of my car. It was hard enough to be clearly heard over the music. My friend was even startled awake and asked what happened. I shrugged it off. I didn't want to stop. This might have been intuition as well, but... I'd rather have rock damage or drive on a flat tire or anything else than stop on that road. It was dark and something just felt wrong. Now, I had really absurdly bright LED headlights on my car and as such I could see a few miles ahead of where my car was going. My friend was watching the road and I slowed down to get a better look while I was still a good distance away. But what I saw, it still freaks me out to this day. The best way that I could describe it was a, a body of a human sort of half contorted downward. The hair and the head were upside down and its arms were like large stalactite looking things. And that thing was so dark as well that my headlights couldn't even penetrate it. However, it illuminated everything around it. Its face wasn't looking at us originally, but it sort of twisted its head to look around at us. It didn't have facial features, but it looked sort of distorted like... It had broken a jaw or something, and it was almost, I don't know, sort of blurry, I guess. I pride myself on my somewhat photographic memory, but it was like it didn't even want me to see it. At this point, we're no more than 50 to 75 feet away, and I just step on it. My friend asks if I saw that, and I nodded my head. I didn't even want to talk about it, if I'm being honest. I didn't even want to breathe. I was just shaking so badly because it felt ominous, evil in fact. I can't even put my finger on it to explain in full detail the fear that I felt, but it was like it penetrated to my bones. It was a primal instinct to run and run as fast as I could away from whatever this thing was. I told her not to look back because we don't want it to follow us, and I swear that I drove a solid 120 until I got off the reservation. 
We didn't end up stopping in Albuquerque either. I just drove all the way to Lubbock instead and we spent the night there. My work asked for paranormal stories and I told this once. A co-worker mentioned putting it on here because she thinks that you guys might like it. Anyway, that's it for my story and I guess I just want to add as well that I reached out to my friend and it turns out that they were awake that entire time. They just had their head resting against the window so it wasn't like we were mistaken with regarding what we saw. So I've never really uh, made a, a post or anything on a story like this, but I've always wanted to share this. At the time that it happened, I did tell my flatmates, but I left out certain details not wanting to seem like a, a weirdo to them. I've had a, a handful of strange experiences throughout my life, but most have been more subtle than what I'm about to share. This happened sometime between 2012 and 2014. I would have been in my late 20s at the time, living in a share house in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. I worked nights packing shelves at a supermarket, a job I absolutely hated, but had kept up all through uni and it got me through. In fact, I had actually graduated in early 2012, but found I was too lazy to just quit. I ended up spending those last few years in the share house kicking around, working this terrible dead-end job, waiting for everyone to go their separate ways so my life could start. After each shift, I, I'd catch the bus home from work at around 11pm, get off at the top of the hill, at the shops, and then walk down the hill towards my home. It was only about a 10 minute walk home from the bus stop and I only mention all these details because I probably caught that bus and made that same walk a thousand times in all the years that I held that job. But this, this was the only time anything even remotely creepy happened. So, I'd hopped off the bus and was headed downhill with the cemetery on my left and a row of simple one and two story homes on my right. I almost never saw any people at this time of night, and that's how quiet the area was. The way is also well lit, and despite a cemetery looming over your shoulder, there's really nothing eerie about it. In fact, it's quite beautiful, really. A well-tended cemetery filled with interesting old markers, statues and things. You'd see people jogging or walking through it most days. The cemetery is bordered by a sandstone wall that follows the way downhill, then left along this coastal road that sort of uh, loops back around almost. Anyway, I was maybe uh, halfway down the hill when a plain white van drove past on my left. At first, I didn't really think anything of it, to be honest. I didn't break pace and the van didn't stop or slow as it went past. I watched the tail lights grow small, sweeping left as it took the band at the bottom of the hill. But as soon as it disappeared, I had this, I don't know, really odd feeling come over me that I was going to see it again. I'm really not sure how else to describe that, but it wasn't like a voice in my head or anything, just an odd fleeting impression that when I get to the bottom of the hill, that the same white van would be waiting for me. So I got to the bottom, turned left, and saw a pair of headlights coming back towards me. They were too far to see if it was the same car, but immediately, I just knew that it was. I didn't feel scared or anything, but I knew that whatever was about to happen was going to happen, whether I wanted it to or not. Again, just a fleeting impression. This time, the van slowed and came to a stop at the side of the road. There was a young driver. I can't remember whether the passenger side window was already open or whether he leaned over to open it, but either way, he leaned across and called to me to come over. All I thought in that moment was that he probably just needs directions. But as I approached, I immediately began to feel very uneasy. That gentle impression that I'd felt earlier, watching the van drive past, now solidified into a, a vague feeling of dread. I felt as if I, I shouldn't get too close. So I came about as far as the grassy verge and, and stopped. I remember the radio in the car was playing, just some random pop song. 
He might have reached over and turned it down. I really can't remember, but I also don't remember too much of what he looked like. Except that he was maybe about my age or maybe a little bit older. Had longish blonde hair and a few days growth on his face. He didn't strike me as threatening, so the unease that I felt was more confusing at first, I guess. But he did speak with a British accent, and I just assumed he was a traveller. Excuse me, he said. Can you help me? I'm trying to get to the cemetery. Now, I was really confused. I mean, just over his shoulder on his right, less than like 20 feet away, the tops of grave markers and crypts poked above the sandstone wall. Like I said, the way was well lit and he would have definitely seen the cemetery as he drove this road a moment before. In fact, he'd driven down to the far end of it, then made a U-turn. That's when I'd seen him coming back, and so, at the other end, where the road loops around the coast, the wall wasn't high at all and you could clearly see all the graves, even in the dark, stretching back up to the hill. In other words, it just made no sense. I was about to answer as well when my blood absolutely ran cold. I froze mid-word, my mouth hanging open, because somewhere in the back of the van, I could clearly hear a woman screaming and crying for help all of a sudden. I could even hear her banging against the inside paneling. I heard it clear as day over the radio playing. I knew it wasn't a recording, but it was also somehow strange and seemed slightly unreal to me. Again, I'm not too sure how to explain it, but I definitely heard it and it scared the heck out of me, but I didn't react the way that I thought I would, I guess. I looked at him and he just stared back and said nothing, making no effort to explain the screams or even acknowledge that we were hearing them, but there was no mistaking it. I could still hear it, clearly, as we just stared at each other. Uh, sorry, I have no idea, was all I could get out in the end. He then nodded, said thanks anyway, and drove off. After that, I ran the rest of the way home, which thankfully was only two minutes away. When I got in, I was out of breath and shaking. My flatmates were all asleep and I went straight to my room. If there had been even 1% of doubt in my mind, like maybe I'd imagined it, I would have probably woken someone first and at least told them what happened. But instead, I called the police. I had to explain the story to two different cops, long story short, because of a, a jurisdictional thing. My area actually fell under a police station further away than the local one that I'd called. They took it seriously, thankfully, took all my details and said that they'd send a car to look for this van. Unfortunately, I hadn't seen the license plate number. In the moment, I hadn't even thought to check, stupidly, I know and my description of the driver wasn't much more detailed than what I've described here now, so that really wasn't much help either. Though they had my details, the police, they, they never called back to follow up, and nothing showed up in the news or any newspapers. When I told my flatmates about this, I left out the strange feelings of dread and just stuck to the details, I guess. But they mostly thought that I'd been pranked somehow, and... Well, I guess that is possible. To this day, I know that that's not what happened at all. It's one of those you-had-to-be-there things, but the whole thing felt so unusual and didn't play out like any kind of prank. The whole event lasted not even three minutes from when he first drove past to when he drove off, and our interaction lasted probably not even 20 seconds, but it has stayed with me for years, and... I often think about it, wondering what happened. Anyway, that's my story. Like I said, I've got a few others, but this one is the most dramatic and I suspect that it's going to stay with me the rest of my life. So I'm 16 years old and I live in Italy. My house is in a little village on the biggest mountain in Europe. And there isn't much activity around here during the day. A very small amount of cars pass by. 
There usually is really no people around, though. It's a very calm and cool place at the end. This event, though, it took place last April. I had just gotten out of school after a two-hour-long Latin test, and I was basically already sleeping at that point. I unlocked my bike, waved at my friends, and I left, taking the main road that led to the village that I live in. As always, there were no cars, no people, no nothing. I was tired, like I said, and while riding, I was thinking about the usual things a 15-year-old is thinking about when coming back from school. The should I do the homework first or video games kind of stuff. I was probably overthinking and kept going along the road without realizing that I didn't take the right hand turn. I noticed my mistake maybe a few minutes later and thought, oh well, never mind, I'll just take the long way home. But because at the end of the road, you could sort of take a path that led to the village anyway. And while I didn't know yet, this was probably the worst mistake that I've made in my entire life. I kept going and at that point the road was sort of winding through a little forest. All the trees above me had stopped the already small amount of light that was there, so it was basically dark at this point. I turned on the bike's flashlight and moved on to the right side of the road. Everything was quiet until I heard a, a car sound coming towards me. I was a bit surprised because, as I already said, there was basically no car activity in the area, especially at this time of day. I didn't panic, I mean, after all, it was just a car passing by. After a while, I saw the headlights approaching from the road. The car was still pretty far away and was going at a slow pace, almost as if the driver was looking for something. Then, the car sped up and, to my surprise, turned right to get in front of me. Confused and not wanting to get hit by a vehicle, I turned left to bring the bike on the other side of the road. But then the car did the same thing and sped up even more. I had very little time now to realize what was happening because the car was coming at full speed towards me and I was about to be hit. So I did the first thing that came to my mind and I jumped off the bike on the right side of the road. I did it just in time as well because the car ran over the empty bike just a few seconds after I jumped. I sat on the asphalt, my knees and elbows burning now from the fall, trying to comprehend what had just happened. When I saw the driver of the car getting out of the vehicle, the guy was now on the side of the road, running towards me, not saying a word. I got up as fast as I could, but the guy managed to grab my left arm. I screamed, turned around, landed the strongest punch that I could possibly take on this guy's nose. The guy didn't flinch though, I let go of my arm, touched his now bleeding nose and just smiled at me, before simply running back into the car, starting the engine again and leaving. I stood there in complete shock, I grabbed what was left of my bike and I just ran home as fast as I could. I was so scared and confused that I even left my backpack in the middle of the road that day and had to go back the next day to get it. And as crazy as that whole 30 seconds or so was, that was it. I never figured out who this guy was, why he tried to run me over with his car like that, or anything. This is by far the most terrifying and most close to death in my life that I've ever been to and I can tell you that I never did take that road again. I'm a 21 year old female and this story took place when I was around 11. I remember this day clearly too because it was the first time that I was ever allowed to walk to school and back by myself. Up until the age of 14, I lived in what we thought was a safe place. Everybody knew everyone. If you thought that you could get away with something, then you needed to be prepared to have your ear abused by the time that you got home. But there was one day though. It was a cold winter day and school unfortunately was still open, so all the neighborhood kids had to walk through knee-high inches of snow just to get to school. It took me longer to leave the house as... I was used to walking with my older sister to school since she knew the routes better than me. 
I always used to make fun of her for being paranoid and taking a different route every day from school, but after that day, I learned that that was what saved my life in the end. As I was waiting by the door to leave, my mum came up to me and told me that I should ride with her to drop me off because my sister was too sick to go today and being a brat, I made a big deal about walking by myself because I was almost 12 years old and all my friends' parents let them walk alone and all that. She looked at me for a long while then told me to make sure that I pay attention to cars. I got hit by a car and almost died when I was nine so... The worry that showed on her face was well warranted. I hurriedly nodded though and headed out the door to go to school. My sister didn't like to dilly dally so she was always in a rush to get to school early but seeing as it was just me I thought that it would be a good idea to take my time. I would play in the brown slush that was left on the side of the road and even make funny looking snowballs to see how far I could throw them. Halfway to school I then notice a white van following behind me at some point. Being the playful child that I was, if I had not been bending down to make another snowball, I probably wouldn't have noticed it slowly creeping up the street. I told myself that I was being stupid, but continued more hurriedly to school upon seeing it. Once I got to school, I took a quick glance over my shoulder and saw the van a few feet behind me. It wasn't until I got onto the school grounds that it drove away fast by me, thought that that would be the end of it to be honest but throughout the day when I would stare out the window the van would always be there. I think I assumed that it never really left just parked or something. Many adults would try to convince me years later that maybe it wasn't the same one but I knew that it was. This van had a bright yellow smile emoji sticker on it that you could spot from anywhere I couldn't see who was in the van, but through the tinted glass, I knew that they could see me. It was now the end of the day, and I wasn't ready to go home, but it was too late to call my mum because she was at work and my sister was home sick, like I said. So I had to suck it up and start walking home. I tried to blend in with a group of kids, but most of them were car riders and the others didn't live near me. Remembering what my sister told me, I took another route home. I didn't memorize this route clearly, but I decided anything was better than being spotted by that van. I made it to my main street, but realized my mistake too late. The route that I took led back to the main street where I walked to school, and hidden behind a row of cars was the white van with the same smiley emoji sticker. I tried to stay calm and walk past it, but once I heard the van door silently click open, I ran. I could hear the rush of two pairs of heavy footfalls behind me. They were getting closer, so I did what any normal kid would do. I cut corners. I cut into someone's backyard until I was directly inside of my house and forced myself into the thick snow to make it to the door. My heart was racing, not because I was running, but because I could still hear them behind me. I made it to the door and banged with all my might until someone came to the door. My sister looked confused, but one look at my face and she pulled me inside and locked the doors. The van, it came around and was still outside. Truthfully, it stayed out there as well until finally my brother got home. Me and my sister, we didn't talk about it, but we both knew how close it was to me going missing that day. I hadn't thought about this incident in years to be honest but one of my hometown friends showed me an article that came out in 2013. Apparently some men kidnapped and assaulted a girl my age and it wouldn't have scared me if it hadn't have mentioned the white van with that same sticker. Whoever they were they had definitely attempted to kidnap me and do... God knows what else to me that day. During my time at university, I had a part-time job at a huge Bavarian company. The building had eight floors and a quadratic shape, with a big lobby hall in the center of the building. It actually was hundreds of years old, but completely renovated. I worked once or twice a week, mainly on the weekends. 
Now, here's the interesting part. So I worked in night shifts and my job was basically to walk around the whole building twice a night. But while walking through the hallways, I just had to watch out for stuff people forgot when they rush into the weekend. Open doors, open windows, or light switches still turned on, stuff like that. It was nothing out of the ordinary. The payment was also pretty good. In fact, I was kind of surprised about just how good the payment was, because obviously I didn't have to do much in those eight hours. My girlfriend and other friends mentioned that the payment is just fair, as I had to walk around a huge building at night, completely alone. But they always mentioned how they would never do this, as sometimes my girlfriend visited me there to bring me some meals. As the sinister feeling in the buildings like these would play mind games with them. I never had problems with being alone though. Neither was I paranoid or believed in paranormal occurrences or anything like that. I just studied throughout the night and did my two walks. That is until this one night in September of 2018. Now the shift started like any other. I got my keys from the janitor and started studying after my first walk through the building. Between 3.55am and 4.05am the whole electronic system throughout the building resets which I found really odd at my first shift but grew to ignore it after some months. The janitor explained the reason after I asked but the reset leads to light sources turning on and off throughout the whole building systematically but still a bit chaotic. I sat at the front desk, not even paying attention to it, when suddenly a, a certain noise reached me. One of the two elevated doors in the first floor opened itself, closed itself, and opened itself again. I just thought to myself, meh, malfunction, and so I went back to reading boring scientific papers. After 20 minutes, it happened again though, but this time, the light in the elevator switched off, which seemed really off to me. At this point, I started to feel a little bit alarmed, I'll admit, but when I moved into the elevator, the door behind me suddenly closed. I panicked a bit and tried to get out of the elevator, but the elevator started to take me to the second floor in complete darkness. When I reached the second floor, the door opened and I basically fell out of the elevator door, turning around while I fell. And then the really sinister looking completely dark elevator closed again and took off to another floor. My heart was racing and a part of me thought that someone manipulated the console but another part of me felt like something else. A fear. You see, I had goosebumps all over my body and returned to the front desk with the plan to text my supervisor and the janitor about a technical defect of the elevator. I did this with trembling hands when I suddenly heard another distant noise radio music from somewhere in the canteen. I slowly moved to the canteen with my smartphone light switched on. The noise came from the kitchen and I followed it. Reaching the kitchen I saw that a radio was playing music on some of the tables. The cooks listened to radio while working. And at that I froze and I couldn't breathe. You see, during my first walk, the janitor texted me to tell me to put the radio under a certain desk and switch it off, as the cooks would always store it there. I did this directly when I started the shift, even texting him, because I couldn't find the desk at first, after plugging out the radio that is. Which means that that radio was not only on, but had definitely moved, and I was the only one in that building. I turned around and I sprinted through the canteen directly to an exit and waited outside for the last two hours. Luckily, I had the keys with me when someone for the day shift came. When he arrived, I got into the building with him, took my bag and I left quickly. I called myself in sick for the next two weeks and after that I quit the job using excuses regarding my sleep cycle. Until this day... I really don't know what happened that night, but something was definitely off. We all make dumb decisions in life, right? Well, in this case, I was stupid. Very stupid. 
See, I arranged to meet a guy off Tinder, but because of my heightened anxiety about driving and stuff, I arranged for him to pick me up outside of my place. I had been talking to him for a few weeks at least, but that is not redeemable and I know that. The choice that I made on this day could have ended me, but thankfully I'm still around to tell the tale. So the guy picked me up in his car and told me that he planned to take us out for sushi. I love sushi, so I thought, great. He put in the name of the restaurant into his GPS and we were off, making pleasant conversation on the way there until I started seeing woods when I looked out my window. I felt very confused. I mean, we were supposed to be going into town, not into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. Fear hit me hard then. He said... I swear the GPS is taking me through here. I didn't choose this path. I said, please, just get us back to civilization. My eyes were wide and I must have looked like a deer in the headlights. His face was really apprehensive, so he must have known that I was scared. Oh my goodness was all I was thinking to myself. I should have just conquered my anxiety about driving and met him somewhere public. Or better yet, not met this guy at all. What was I thinking? I'm going to get murdered here in these woods. I tried checking my phone to see if I could assist him with the GPS, and that's when he said those spine-chilling words. There's no signal out here. I remember just thinking to myself to try to look calm. Don't let him think that you suspect that he's onto something. But man, did I feel terrified. The tips of my fingers were cold while I was simultaneously sweating. If he was going to kill me, part of me wanted him to get it over with so I wouldn't be left in so much anticipation. His forehead was perspiring and he kept saying, I swear I'm not doing this. I'm trying to get us back on route to the sushi place. I then said, Listen, I don't care about sushi anymore. Just get us to a gas station, anywhere with people at this point. He said, I don't have a shovel or a weapon in my trunk or anything if that's what you're thinking which did little to calm my nerves. We finally reached the restaurant after what felt like an eternity. I had never been so scared in my life, in fact. I didn't have much of an appetite, and I was physically trembling when we arrived, but I figured that he didn't kill me when he had the chance, so I guess it was safe now to continue with our date. I already planned on taking an Uber home because I didn't want to go through that experience again. And I was shocked out of my mind when he then asked, So, when do you think that we'll have sex? I nearly choked on a piece of my food. What? I didn't know where this was coming from. I didn't know how he could ask me something like this now on our first date when he literally saw me pale as a ghost just moments ago. You know, like, how long will it take? A day? A week? A month? I stared at him, dumbfounded. I couldn't respond because... I was just utterly speechless in that moment. Well, I can't wait a whole month, I'm telling you that now, he said. I didn't say anything and the rest of the date was insanely awkward. I said goodbye as I took my Uber home and only seconds after my driver pulled out of the restaurant parking lot, he texted me to say that he doesn't think that it'll work out with me because he needs a girl with a higher libido. I didn't argue. I just texted back a, a simple, okay, ready to be done with this guy. When the Uber driver drove me home, he did not take me through the wilderness pathway of a potential murder site too. He took me home through streets, other cars, lights, the sweetest scene to my immense relief. I couldn't help but wonder too why my date had to take me through an hour drive through the wilderness to get to the restaurant but it only took the driver 15 minutes to get me home from the same location. The whole thing was weird and chilling, and I don't know if my date planned on anything sinister, and maybe he backed out, or if it was an honest mistake, but I'm glad that I made it out of there unscathed. I learned a tough lesson that night, one that I should have already known, but that I foolishly ignored for some reason. The moral of the story is that you shouldn't let strangers from dating apps pick you up in their cars.
So this happened to me about a year ago after I moved back home with my parents, after leaving an abusive relationship. I'm lying in bed, getting ready to go to sleep, performing my daily ritual of cuddling my dog while I browse TikTok and Reddit for longer than I should. My dog is a black Labrador. She's just about five months old and she's just the cutest. One thing that I never noticed about dogs though was how aware they are of their surroundings all the time. As I'm lying in bed, my dog is laid beside me sleeping when she suddenly perks her head up to listen. I stop what I'm doing after noticing her concentration. I'm listening to see what she's woken up for when I hear footsteps outside. To get access to the back garden of my house, you need to go through the side gate and walk around the length of the house to get to my bedroom window at the back. Our whole back garden has stones on the ground. As I'm in bed, I then hear the stones moving as apparently a person walks over them. The stones gradually get louder and stop at my bedroom window. I am completely frozen, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. I'm wondering, who is outside and why are they outside? I live in the country and my parents were both working night shift that night. And then, I suddenly see a light flashing through the gaps of my blind and the flash switches off. It then goes on again as if a, a photo has been taken on the flash. The footsteps finally start again, only this time they're quicker. I'm so freaked out that I end up calling my mum and she ends up coming home to check up on me. She comes with me to check if there's anyone in the back garden, but before we get to the gate, we notice that it's been left wide open. But what's really strange is that it's only able to be opened from the inside, not outside. We never did find out who was in my garden that night, but it still sends shivers up my spine whenever I think about it. I came home from work today to receive some very unsettling news from one of my roommates. It started when I went to let the dogs out into the backyard. Our backyard is in the kitchen, so on my way to let them out, I passed by the oven and noticed that it was on. It surprised me a bit because my roommate, Mandy, was the only other person home, and she had been spending most of her time back in her room due to feeling ill. Even so, I... Figured that I'd better ask her first before turning it off, on the off chance that she was actually using the oven. I went to the end of the hallway where her room was, knocked on her door and asked, Hey, uh, is the oven supposed to be on? Like, are you using it right now? Confusion and concern was immediately apparent in her voice as she replied, What? No, I haven't even been out in the kitchen today shared her confusion obviously in concern about hearing this but then pondered the possibility that Carl her brother and our other roommate had been the one to leave it on by mistake. I asked her if this could be the case and she then told me that Carl was still at work and had been since early that morning. This was when she and I began to piece together that something very strange had had to have happened. I told her that I had just gotten home a few minutes prior, it was a little after 3pm at that point, and I left the house at about 7.30 that morning. She then informed me with horrific realisation that around 11am she had heard noises coming from the living room, including a woman's voice, a chair moving, and the front door even opening. She didn't realise at the time that I was at work, so she just assumed that it was me and didn't think much of it. She then mentioned that in hindsight though, the dogs were barking an unusual amount during this time. I asked her how long the noises coming from the living room went on for, and she said that it was hard to tell because she was trying to sleep at the time, but if she had to guess, they lasted about 20 minutes. Mandy, Carl and I are the only current residents of this home, and as mentioned before, Carl and I are both at work during the time frame, so... Andy was the only person who reasonably should have been in that house at that time. I thanked her for informing me of this and then went back to the front half of the house and did a quick comb of the area to check for anything else that looked out of place or maybe missing. I didn't discover anything else out of the ordinary and as of the time of sharing this, nothing else has come of it. Oh, but uh, one pretty minor but still pretty weird thing is that 
I went to the hall closet to get more toilet paper for my bathroom and I noticed an empty wrapper packaging for a new pillow in there. I didn't buy a new pillow recently. I asked both of my roommates if they did and Mandy said that she bought a new pillow about a month ago but that she threw the packaging away. This is my first time noticing the packaging in that hall closet and I last went into the hall closet just a couple of weeks ago if I remember correctly. Anyway, it's a minor detail and I'm really not sure about it so it could be nothing but I thought that I would just mention it.